call the meeting to order, I guess, for January 13th, 2020. Um, first thing that uh, we always do is approve the agenda, and uh, if there's any add-ons or changes um, from the rest of the board, I'd like to hear now. If not, um, I actually do have an add-on that I'd like to put on there. And it's, a, it's to uh, have a brief discussion about uh, Harwood Union's proposed budget for 2020. Uh, we can get into the details on that. Um, I'd like to do it before we get into manager's items um, because I think it, it's kind of uh, important that it, we do discuss it before the manager's items because it may have pertained to what we're talking about tonight. So. With that change, uh, if there's no others, I'd take a motion to approve the agenda. Is this thing working? No. There. Try that now. Okay. Motion uh, to make a motion to approve the agenda with the addition um, of the discussion of the Harwood school budget. I'll second. Okay. Uh, next thing to do is to approve the consent agenda items. For some reason, this doesn't want to stay on. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Public. Is there anybody from the public here who wishes to speak? I don't see anybody. So we can scratch that off the list. And on to the Harwood Union District budget discussion. So this weekend I was contacted by two of the uh, uh, Waterbury School Board representatives. Uh, we spent some time together on Sunday after uh, brief uh, emails and texts back and forth on Saturday. They uh, came and met with me in reference to the difficulties that they're having trying to get a resolution on a budget proposal at Harwood Union. Um, there's a big concern right now that, um, that the decision will be made based on what their board is going through to kind of stick with uh, no changes to the budget as presented on the sheet you see in front of you. You've got six options there. It looks like um, they're having difficulty, number one, selecting any one of these six options. Uh, and of the six, it seems as though they're, a lot of the school board members are pushing hard to stick with status quo, which basically means little to no change, which would be the base budget, the, the the typical number one line item base budget here um, with a total reduction and you look down there where it says total reductions under each option uh, of uh, minimal 195,150 and uh, you can see up top there some of the changes that they're proposing to make um, to get that deduction which are basically minimal changes. Uh, they did explain to me somewhat of what these changes were. Um, I had difficulties with some of the abbreviations and still now, even then, I can't quite remember what some of the abbreviations are. But the long and the short of the conversation was that they're having difficulty coming to a conclusion as to which one of these six options to choose. Um, I've been told that if you look on, well, if you look on the back of your sheet, uh, down at the bottom, you will see uh, the common level of appraisal, uh, percentages, Waterberries is, you know, up there substantially. I mean, there's a few others that are this, you know, a little bit higher. Uh, but below that, the increase in our uh, current rate um, under the five, six different choices, 
Waterbury's uh, tax rate, if they go with the status quo budget, our tax rate would raise somewhere in the 7.1% range. And then down through the five different, six different choices, the last choice being the 2.8% um, increase is, of the six choices, is the uh, cheapest, cheapest for basically everybody and what that consists of is the closing of the Faiston School. Um, that, that saves the district uh, $1.4 million. And their concern is that right now, they're, the Waitsfield Warren district area over there, the, the, the schools Faiston Warren Waitsfield, they're pushing hard to have no changes at all to stick with the first option. Um, which our taxes would increase 7.1%. Uh, and then on top of that, try to come to us at some point down the road here uh, and ask for a bond of 30 to 35 million for upgrades. And uh, so there's a huge concern for us to try to st <laughs> stop that from happening. Um, I have talked to other people. I did talk to one resident of Faiston uh, this weekend and uh, asked them, without any conversation about this, asked them what choice they would like to see. And that particular resident said, I want to see Faiston closed. Um, so I guess I'm here tonight in part to ask for you know, the taxpayers of Waterbury and f for the board that represent, the school board that represents Waterbury, at least the two that I met with, to uh, see if the board would agree to have a letter drafted uh, in support of the option six of the $1.472 million savings um, and encourage the school board to go with that option uh, in order to obviously try to <laughs> decrease our tax burden but if they're going to be asking for a bond of 30 to 35 million on top of that it could be very detrimental to our uh, tax rate and our in the towns our municipal ability to uh, to do anything on our own. Um, and I don't know, I've thought a little bit about how this letter should be drafted. Um, I guess I'd first like to hear from the rest of the board as to how they feel about this. Uh, and maybe some of, if you've got any questions, if I can answer them, I will. Um, <clears throat> Chris. Do you know, can you run down those discretionary reductions that are in option six? Do you know exactly what those mean? You're talking about the reductions identified that yeah, would occur the, under all the, options? Yeah, the difference between so, five and six seems to be those like five for, reductions. Yeah. From what I understand, the sustainability ad at Crossett Brook eliminated that is a apparently a teacher's position. Apparently they have a program over there that has to do with um, basic, basically self-sustainability. In other words, learning how to uh, take care of yourself at your home, growing a garden and uh, raising livestock, um, other aspects of self-sustainability. Um, whether it be learning how to uh, you know, put up put up crops for the winter, um, but um, I meant the section below because all of those are the same no matter what option, right? On that section, it's that reductions to meet board directive section one down. Oh, okay. Uh, boy, that's where I, I'm going to have some difficulty. Um, 
he told me what the reduction of district-wide curriculum PD expense that uh, he had a difficult time explaining that one to me. Um, Bill, do you know what PD would be? I was hoping I, sh I should have asked one of the board members to come tonight. They could have helped us through this a little bit. Uh, reduction of $50,000 added for HHB legal to 20000 That's uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm really struggling with these uh, abbreviations. Obviously, there's, you know, the one that's obvious is music teacher ad at Cross of Book would be eliminated. Uh, nurse ad 50, yeah. But the music teacher in option six looks like it's, it's not. That option isn't executed in that option. What I'm reading, it looks like. Right. There's different scenarios. So right. Let me see if. I'm trying to get to a number. Yeah, it's in some of the options, they eliminate it, and some of them they don't. Right. I know that they pertain to. Um, well, what they did tell me was that of all the options, five and six, doesn't eliminate any teachers or programs. So these other items have got to be uh, programs or teachers' positions, if I can, maybe I can text one of the uh, board members and see if they'll call in and, and maybe they can answer these for us over the phone. But it looks like option five is basically the elimination of Faceton, but no programs are affected in the lower section. Is that the difference between five and six has those five options that are Can I ask a question? What What is the deadline or the time frame by which um, kind of commentary would be ideal? Because I think it would be good to have somebody come here and talk to us about this. They are um, out at, at crunch time here. Wednesday night is... Uh, know how how likely it is for us to give you know good information um, just saying choose six because that's the lowest tax rate for everybody you know on the um, on the bond and I'm not I'm not here speaking in favor of the bond but <clears throat> if you have a 35 million dollar bond um, Uh, well, go ahead and answer that. James, appreciate you calling. Um, Who is it, Chris? James Grace. James Grace. So we're going through the list here of um, the two sheets that you gave me. I don't know if you have those available or whether you can answer the questions uh, over the phone here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the column where you have the six options listed and you have the reductions meet board's directive, there's uh, a fairly substantial list on column two. Uh, the first one is eliminate placeholder for hearing project. Now that I ask you that, I remember that that's a program for hearing impaired, correct? Can okay. Can put that on speaker by any chance? Um, yeah, I think I can. Here, hang on. Yes. Okay. Great, thanks. Bye. He's coming. He'll be here in five minutes. Okay. Bill, do you know? Um, have Have you seen this yet? 
before the meeting? Uh, only what I've read in the paper. Um, those percentage increases, are those percentage increases on the the school portion of the tax bill? Yeah. <clears throat> I believe they are. So on the back of the page, you see the current tax rate uh, for Waterbury is $1.68, I believe. Is that true? For education. So you'd have to increase it. Yeah. So a dollar sixty-eight, if it went up uh, to seven point one percent, it would go up to a dollar eighty. And if it went to uh, if it went up to two point eight percent, it would go up to a dollar seventy-three, I guess. I think you were. <clears throat> what yeah, what I was going to say about the bond, and you know, I don't know what they're talking about, uh, but I've heard the same numbers. So, a thirty-five million dollar bond, if you, um, if that's over thirty years, that's one point one million, one point one six million of principal, and if it's a five percent rate, you would double that. So you'd have a bond payment of 2.33 million if it were a 33 a 30 year bond in the in the most expensive year it would be 2.33 million and 2.33 million on their on their base budget of 40 million is it's a 5% increase um, and if you divide it into the Minus the revenues, you know the revenue. It's a, looks like thirty-two million nine forty-eight down at the bottom in the worst-case scenario. So if you divide it into that, thirty-two nine forty-eight eight sixty-five. That's about a seven percent increase. So you know it, it's. I'm not saying five percent and seven percent is nothing, uh, but it's you know it's. That service over a period of time, and whether it needs to be a $35 million bond or a $15 million bond is maybe a debatable question. But the school's Harwood was built in what opened in 1964 or something like that. So you know it's pushing 50 years old here, and you're going to have to spend something on infrastructure. They don't last forever. But the school boards. Concern is that well, to, to try to accept both of these uh, current budget and what it is without any deductions. Their their goal was to offset the impact of the bond right. by the closure of the school, so that there be less of an impact overall. To, right. the, to the tax rate. Well, I, I understand what, what their concern is. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, don't worry about it. All I'm trying to do is give you some parameters in terms of understanding what a $35 million bond means. Uh, you know, the closing of the schools, I've attended some of the public hearings, and I, you know, what's the, the number of students in the district? Looks like it's about 17 or 1800 students altogether. Right. Right. And uh, uh, so it's, I think it's like $18,000 per student, isn't it? Yeah, it's up top. It's well, that, 18 to 19,000, depending on budget. Right. So, um, but it's interesting when you look at these numbers here um, you're going from 40 million 472 to 39 195 hi thanks for coming can you sit up there and stay back here? yeah you can, can sit, sit right there. there it's fine do you need a copy or you got one you got one Me too. Yeah, yeah, another meeting, right? What questions can I answer for you? 
Um, I had asked the question, um, maybe you could just quickly run down the reductions to meet board directive and explain what, what each, I was specifically asking about option six, but since you're here, maybe you could just explain that list if you don't think it would take too long. Um, I can go through, it's not complicated. Well, take that back. We'll, we'll wait and see whether it's complicated. Um, all right, so that first one, uh, you want me to start with the stuff that's included in all options or just the discretionary stuff? I think um, just because the all options one, there's really isn't any choice there, right? Yep. All right, so the hearing project, um, if any of you have kids in the school system, uh, you may have seen the teachers wearing um, the stuff around their neck. There's a receiver, um, and when they talk, um, it goes into a system where if there's hearing impaired kids, they have headphones they can put on and hear that. They found that it's super helpful also for kids with attention issues. Um, and so there's a program at Thatcher Brook that's been in use for a while. They're getting a lot of good use out of it. They want to expand that across the district. Um, and so that was a proposal um, to the tune of 40 grand that um, we'd of course like to do, but it's, um, it's on that, that list. And that 40,000 40, would expand it into the, the other schools? Yes. Uh, District-wide curriculum professional development. So there's a line item for professional development for uh, the teachers in the curriculum area. Um, obviously a great thing to have our teachers getting professional development um, experience, but uh, that's on the list for reduction. Um, the next one is legal expenses. Um, we've been encountering more and more legal expenses with respect to um, bullying and um, Freedom of Information Act requests, and so that's not something we had previously budgeted for, um, and we are trying to budget for it this year. Uh, we've been paying for that out of other areas. So the admin team originally was looking for 50 grand, um, and they're willing to reduce it to to 20. Again, that's uh, we like to not get sued or get involved in those things, but we do. So um, we're budgeting for that. Do you know where that's landed the last couple of years? Um, in terms of where it, how it's been paid for? Well, just what that expense was, because you said that you typically don't budget for it, but you're having expenses. Yeah, it's been increasing. So, you know, there's a, the superintendent was talking about a specific situation recently where um, it was a bullying situation and um, both sides ended up getting counsel, and so we had to get counsel, and I think that one situation cost us about five or $6,000. So, you know, this is budgeting for, you know, a couple of instances a year. Uh, the Wellness Center at Harwood uh, is a program that was uh, initiated by the students. Um, it's for people struggling with various mental health um, related stuff or what it means to go to school. Uh, it's really important to a lot of the a lot of the students, um, which means it's pretty important to a lot of board members. Um, we'd really like to keep that one that one in, but it is a new um, initiative that was being uh, added to staff that at the high school. So, what is the delay of 0 0.50? Like is that? Um, I think what they're trying to say with uh, delay is, you know, that they won't do it this year, but we'd like to do it in a future year. So that's a half time. It's a half a position. Half, -time half position a guidance staff. officer. Yep. And there's no staff for that right now. Uh, I believe it's not. But it's not there now. Yes, it's a new program. So John, just to, I mean James, just to help me as we're Happens going all the time. <laughs> going down through this, um, the first column, the base budget, that's the base last year's budget with increases and these things added into it, right? Yes, that was the original <clears throat> proposal from, um, from the admin team uh, when we started this process. So that's a 4.85% 4 increase on the expenditures, right? Yes. And then the next column over is all those things get taken out that we're talking about now, right? <clears throat> yeah, we had a long meeting where we had a bunch of discussions about what we were willing to tolerate. We ultimately passed a motion saying we only want a 2.2% increase and that's the, the budget that complies with that directive.
Okay. So when you say 2.2, it says 2.9 in that same column down at the bottom. Yes. So is it 2.2 because you, the revenues drop it to a 2.2 tax increase, or what does the... My understanding is that that's as close as they could get to the 2.2. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay. But the column number 5 and 6 is 2.14, 1.54. Uh, yeah, so this is, you know, as you guys are, we're in budget season, right? So we've been in a bunch of different discussions. <coughs> that second column was something that was presented at a moment in time. Right. Um, there was then another meeting where, you know, we weren't happy with where we were that produced the next four columns of, of information. So this particular summary sheet is just <coughs> summarizing the various things we reviewed at various points in the process. Okay, so I think what Mark was asking for earlier were sliding over to columns five and six. Column five doesn't have any of those reductions except it has a million dollar reduction for operational savings. And then the column to the right of that has the million dollar operational savings <clears throat> plus some of the savings for the programs that are listed above, right? Yes. Is the operational savings closing a school? Is that what the big deal? Is that what the big difference is? What's that $1 million in those two last columns? Not closing a school. So um, we have <coughs> adopted a plan by a narrow margin as a district, um, and by narrow margin I mean on the board, um, that includes a bunch of things, but I always summarize it with three major things. So um, first is closing Payson Elementary School. Second is moving all fifth and sixth graders from Moortown <coughs> Elementary School to Crossy Brook, so they follow a similar pattern that we do at Patrick Brook. And third is combining all the seventh and eighth graders at Crossy Brook. Um, so this particular budget line item reflects implementation of the second two of those. So it's moving the fifth and sixth graders to Crossy Brook and combining all of our seventh and eighth graders at Crossy Brook. The faced in topic would be additional uh, savings to the tune of about another half a million dollars a year. Um, but there are a lot of reasons I'm not going to go into unless you want me to about why we, that's not on the table. No, no, I, I'm just trying to understand. So that the million 45,000 in the two right hand columns just shuffles the deck in terms of where students are going, but it doesn't close a school. Correct. Okay, um, so, so on the table right now, <clears throat> from the board's perspective, at least today, Faiston isn't scheduled to close on any of these scenarios. Correct. Okay. See, I, was, I, I guess I was, had misunderstood that <clears throat> through yesterday's conversation. It's easy to misunderstand. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts. So the reason that those final two, so uh, if you've paid any attention to the you know that we've uh, discussed this um, merging of the middle schools topic about a thousand times and voted um, various ways. The reason it's back on the table yet again is because when we finally got to this point and seeing these numbers, we were faced with, you know, a 2.9% increase with a bunch of really painful programming cuts or a 1.5% increase with implementing a plan that we had already agreed to implement um, anyway. And so there are certainly many board members that don't agree with my point of view, but my point of view is we've already agreed we're planning to make those changes. The, ad the admin team says they can do it for next year. We can get all of those. I mean, the other big difference is in column two, all of these savings are one year. Um, right. We'll be having the same discussion next year about all these programs versus making these other changes is operational savings that we get every year from now on. So on Wednesday this week, is your expectation the board is going to choose one of these scenarios, one of these six? That's what we've said. So by law, we need to, um, you know, the exact date doesn't happen to fall on a board meeting date, but we need to have the final warning done by next, not two days from now, but the following Wednesday. And so if we don't leave Wednesday's meeting with a single direction, we're going to have a problem. Have to have a special meeting. Yeah. yeah. So, and, 
and I know I'm dominating the conversation, I apologize, but, um, and I, I acknowledge that I live in Waterbury and not in one of the valley towns or Moortown. Um, it seems that if these programs that are listed in the second column, the hearing program, the wellness that you've already described, can be all kept in place in the fifth column and, and keep all the schools open, at least for now, and to save a million dollars, which would be a 2.14% increase, that seems like, you know, kind of splitting the baby, so to speak. I agree with you. Mark, do you want to have a definition of the rest of those line items, or are you content so far with what you're hearing? I mean, I think maybe we, we can get into a little bit more, because I'm not sure. I mean, I think I understood what your goal was, Chris, tonight was for us to draft a letter stating our support of a, maybe a specific option. And um, I guess, Bill, I'd ask, I'd turn to you and say, has the board done it in the past? Is that something that you would suggest we consider? And then my personal question would be, could we, instead of necessarily picking an option, which you know, I, think, I think I understand what the scenario, and I think I, I personally, just on a quick glance, would lean towards five, just because I don't see a reduction of, um, of programs, but um, more of maybe a letter stating that we would ask that the board consider the options that would lower the increase and then hope that they would land on five. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's better to say, you know, we, we would support an option that doesn't go higher than 3% and then hope that they, you know, kind of fall into place. But I don't know if the board's done this in the past or. Um, I can't remember the select board uh, weighing in specifically about a budget or writing a letter to the school boards. Um, you know, um, there's always been the conversation about, wow, if the school goes up X percent, it's all in the same tax bill, we have to collect it and, you know, it, it limits us or it, it could be perceived to limit us. I don't necessarily agree with that. but. I understand the sentiment. Um, you know, the select board has, they've had members attend the board meetings back in the day when the budgets were all voted from on the floor. A number of the select board members and myself went. I still try to go to the annual meeting even though the budgets are all voted on by Australian ballot. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't do it. It's, I think from the, if I were on the board, it's a little hard based on 10 minutes of information to make a, a good uh, letter that represents the, the board in your representation of the community. Um, I'm sure James and others would love to hear from you, especially, you know, individually. But um, I think it's a hard thing to do to come up with a, a cogent uh, policy that you can defend in a, in a letter at this late date, but that's just my opinion. That's pretty much how I was feeling. I, the comment I'll make if I am not going to try to sway you guys one way or the other. Um, we, we have heard from a couple of the other select boards as part of this process. Um, I agree that to the extent that I have experience living and participating in this town, I, I would say it's not common for letters to fly back and forth between the boards um, but I think in this particular juncture that we're at um, we've certainly been hearing um, the ones I'm aware of are from Moortown and, and Faiston so it would not be unprecedented to hear from uh, the select boards as part of this process but I'm also sensitive to the fact that I drove down here on five minutes notice and gave you five minutes of information so yeah. you know I'll let you decide how you want to go forward, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. How many children would be involved in the moving of the seventh and eighth graders? Um, I can certainly look it up in my laptop, but off the top of my head, I'll say our, we're probably around 100 at Harwood Middle School right now. Okay. 
That was the movie in the fifth and sixth, right? No, that's no, seventh, seventh and eighth. Eight. Eight. Fifth and sixth would be another 35, 40. Something like that, yeah. yeah. And, that's, that's high estimate, I would guess. and that's only an option two. Right. The, those last two options with the significant savings both include combination of the seventh and eighth graders at CrossFit Brook and moving more town fifth and sixth graders to CrossFit Brook. Got it. Right. Okay. Again, just speaking for me, and I know there's petitions out in the community and the like, um, I think we have to make decisions <clears throat> as a district for the benefit of the district as a whole. And, and again, I acknowledge that I'm in Waterbury, which is the biggest town and is a, one of the towns in the state that's been growing a little bit. And Thatcher Brook has more <clears throat> students and everything else. but. I, I think that I'd like you to hear from me anyway that the idea that um, the voters should support any move to make decisions bound by votes of individual towns is a bad thing uh, from my perspective. So I'm just talking to you now at the moment. So. You and I are in violent agreement on that topic. <laughs> uh, violent agreement. Wow. I'm you, not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Could you no. just say that again, Bill? Yeah, I was going to ask you to clarify what, that, that a little more. So we voted, we voted, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever it is, to become a consolidated district in advance of, well, Act 46 was passed by the legislature, which basically said we should consolidate school districts. The Harwood Union District was a district that decided on its own to, to do it. We voted to do it as opposed to some school districts who are still suing the state and trying to get judges now to overturn, uh, you know, mandated uh, consolidations. And when we voted to consolidate, the Articles of Consolidation basically said, you know, for the purposes of schools, we're one district. We're going to have one board. There'll be representatives from each town on the board. But that board will make decisions for the district. And I, I'm sure it's because of the issues of closing schools. And, and I appreciate that. I understand why people are concerned about the closure of schools. But there's a movement now out in the community, and you may see a petition. And if you sign the petition, and if the petition gets on the ballot, and then that ballot, uh, that question passes, what it would say is, the, even though we're a consolidated district and we have a unified board, the board can't choose to make a decision to close a school unless that individual town votes to close the school. Yeah. I think I have that right, don't I? Yes, you do. Oops. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> we'll see where that, that uh, bag of crap lands. Well, but just so you understand uh, what, what's being talked about from some people who are circulating the petition, I think, is that they want to have local control. And for them, local control is having an individual town vote on their school closure or not. Um, and the local control that we've adopted under this form of government that we all voted to adopt is a unified, you know. So it's like in the old days, if you remember your U.S. history, you know, there was uh, nullification and ratification that, that certain state, you know, you could say, well, we don't agree with that law, so we're going to nullify it. And that was found to be unconstitutional. So. So for, for me, after meeting with the board members, uh, my bigger concern is the potential, likely potential, from what I understand, of uh, of of the budget of these changes not being made, a possible. Uh, you know, first scenario here of of uh, basically no no little to no reduction at all 
and then a possible bond vote for the addition to the school systems upgrades afterwards is going to, you know, the burden of that will drastically hamper our ability to try to take care of some of the problems that we're faced with in our own town, and I know other towns are too. I spoke with the uh, chair of the Duxbury Select Board tonight before coming to this meeting, and they're up in arms at their current, you know, circumstance on, you know, and then having to look at a substantial increase in the education tax, let alone dealing with their own problems. Um, they're beside themselves right now as to what to do. So I just thought that a letter of, of support of either option five or option six uh, and an explanation as to why we support those, the fact that the impact of any of the other options may drastically reduce our ability to take care of some of our own things. Uh, that's always been one of the crippling forces in the past, I believe. Uh, that's why you know, we're in the condition we're in with our infrastructure and other issues. Uh, some people don't think that we're, you know, we're having a difficult time funding all the things that we're trying to fund, but you know, I, I, I guess I see it differently. So that's my pitch. And Mike, you're kind of coming in half, halfway through the game here. Uh, um, those two, the million forty-five option. Is it fair to say that that is a consolidation effort? Is that how you would kind of define that as? If we came out and said we're in support of any effort to consolidate and not reduce programming, would that basically say we're, and, and like how, are other towns that the letters that you've received from other towns, are they actually doing maybe what was kind of being presented, which is like literally pick an option versus if we spoke in the broader picture of we support efforts of reducing expense through consolidation, which would start to like say we are supporting five and six without necessarily saying we've been presented with this piece of paper, we choose option five and six, you know, like. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, a couple things. I think using the phrase we're in support of um, options that choose consolidation versus limiting programs or even just using the phrase consolidation, y yes, I think that would be interpreted the way you want it to be interpreted. Um, second, when I was referring to previous communications from the select boards far earlier in this process, so um, I don't know that it's productive to go into those in detail, but um, Faiston and, and Moortown, both of those communities have, have felt strongly about the process we've been through and we heard from their select board as part of that, so not specific to this, this budget stuff. Um, my point earlier was simply that it's not unprecedented for us to get input from the select boards uh, this year in particular as we're making some of these difficult um, decisions. So I don't, I think the way you, you phrase that would, would be well understood by the board. Um, you know, I, I do want to comment one thing further. Um, if we, and again, and we, I could talk for an hour and a half about education funding and you'd still not you know, you leave with your head spun, spinning um, in terms of how we do it in the state. But I think it's important to notice or to note that if we look, the, the percent increase that you're seeing here is not going to translate one for one to a tax increase that we see. Um, if we look at the first column, that 4.85%, um, again, I could open my laptop and give you specific numbers, but in Waterbury, that translates to about an 8% increase in, in taxes. Uh, and Duxbury, I think, was eight or nine. Um, and so, you know, even if we do adopt five or six where we see those lower percentage increases, um, the actual impact to taxes is going to be higher than that. Is that what's on the back? Probably, yeah, yes. it is. Um, thank you. I should have turned it over. So the, the driving reason behind that is this thing called the common level of appraisal. Um, which I will vastly oversimplify by saying that they 
the state looks at the past three years of, of sales and how home sales in a particular town um, and compares that to the grand list value. Um, and if your home sale average is higher than your grand list value, you pay more tax and the opposite otherwise. Why do they do that? They're trying to make sure that um, for towns where uh, prosperity is increasing, and they, they measure that by the comparison between uh, sale, home sales and, and grand list value, um, that we get assessed additional taxes. Um, in this particular year, both Waterbury and Duxbury are, are seeing um, a, a larger impact of that particular equation, which from my point of view as a Waterbury resident, um, even acknowledging my role to be um, you know, a steward of the entire district is, is increasingly problematic. Um, yeah, but so the, the, I mean, it's, it's not intended to penalize towns for prosperity. The law says that you're supposed to pay for your education taxes based on fair market value, and fair market value is 100%. So if you have a piece of property, or if you have a property that's worth a million dollars and somebody's paying, you know, 1.1 million for it, then that means your grand list is 10% lower than it should be. So your common level of appraisal is gonna be 90%. And it, it basically equalizes the payment across the district and across the state. And it's a, it's a little bit complicated, but it's not intended to punish anybody. It's just to try to put everyone on the footing because if you could pay only on the grand list of your property that your local listers put into the grand list, well, then they could say, well, we want to depress our taxes, so we're going to list everything at 10% lower than it should be. And if there was no means to equalize, there'd be an incentive to to list your property at a at an improper value. So it's just it's part of the formula, but that's why a, a four percent increase translates into a seven percent tax increase. It's one of the reasons. The other reason has to do with the the right. state aid per student and all that kind of stuff. And the only reason I chose to bring that up right now as you guys were kind of contemplating this decision is I, I wouldn't want you to leave this meeting thinking that you know, your, the tax bills are going to correspond to the number that's at yeah. the bottom of that. I think they already looked sheet. at the other side of the paper before you got here, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll keep talking. Um, I personally think that I would be in support of forming some kind of letter expressing our concerns as a board of increased costs and affordability um, and, and saying that we su would support efforts to retain, for me personally, it would be to retain programming but to consider um, options of consolidation, um, which I think basically directs towards option five if, if you go off of that letter, um, which hopefully would be an option that the school board would consider that would be what seems to be one of the most or least impactful budgets to the current rate um, without necessarily picking an option. Um, and maybe that can live on until a, a board decides that they don't want to support that kind of thought process, but that's kind of where I would lean towards versus if, if we come out with a letter and says we support option five of whatever we've been presented with, the next meeting that things change doesn't really live on is what I, I kind of am thinking, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know exactly how to approach should there be any wording in there, and then this is just a question as to uh, the, the difficulties that higher taxes have on the municipality and its inability to even catch up with some of the issues that, you know, we're having difficulty financing now? Or is that, I mean, I, I'd like to make this letter at least somewhat descriptive to 
how it's going to impact us. I mean, obviously we're going through our budget season right now. Obviously we know, you know, we won't know until bill's completely done, but you know, I'm surmising that uh, if we're going to try to accomplish anything at, at all in this town beyond, you know, just basic, um, meeting basic budget needs to do it to do to do with our infrastructure uh, it's going to be difficult if we're faced with a pretty substantial increase from the from the education level so I don't know how to put anything in writing or if we even if you even think that we should that would kind of lean in that direction and Bill, Bill's got this well I, I think I think you know I think Mark's uh, statement about commenting on affordability kind of says what you need to say about that. I think you need to be careful about how you couch things when you say, well, if you do something, it's going to prevent us from doing something that we need to do. Because, you know, um, we just voted to spend a million dollars to buy two fire trucks, and maybe people on the school board was saying, for crying out loud, Waterbury, you know, they went out and they, they, they're going to spend a million dollars and they're talking about paving and, and that's going to impact how people vote on our budget. I, I think you have to be careful about that. It would be nice if we lived in a place, and you know, I've suggested this in the past, that, you know, if you, if you were starting over, you would create a, a government that had the responsibility for everything that the government is asked to do on the local level. You'd have schools, fire, police, recreation, all in one budget, and then people get to kind of balance it and say, this is what we want to do. But we live in a, in a place, in a time, where the school has their own elected officials, they worry about school stuff, and then we have to worry about everything else. So I think it's a little bit um, problematic to to say you shouldn't do something because it's going to affect us. I, I think if you want to talk about affordability, talk about uh, consolidation seems like a good way to get there. That's fine, but I, I, it's your letter. I mean, I don't know who's going to yeah, write it. No, and, uh, to, and to your comments, I'll, I'll just say this, that I had expressed, that's one of my big concerns about, you know, how our government's laid out we're a select board for the municipality. You got the school board for the school board. And everybody, from what I've experienced and witnessed, for the most part, everybody's under the mindset that that's their problem, this is our problem, and there's no broader scope uh, vision as to how all those things, once they come together, you know, impact everybody. And, and that has always bothered me. Um, to your point, I mean, like you said, if everything was under one roof, uh, and of course we eliminated Act 60, the 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 uh, in income sensitivity rebate process, everybody would get the full taste of the impact, and probably things would be a lot different. But, but here but, we are in the circumstance that we're in, and right, because we're living in a state that's a couple hundred years old that has a constitution and a, a body of laws that grew up over the past couple hundred years. And back when, you know, we first started doing things, it was all one. There might have been two boards, but it was a Waterbury School Board and a Waterbury Select Board and a Duxbury School Board and a Duxbury Select Board. And over time, because of population and size and we're in a modern, 21st century now, as opposed to a really, you know, agrarian uh, 19th century when a lot of this stuff came forward, we're still living with the structures of, you know, the 1870s and 80s, and it's the 2020s, and and that's the hand we're played, we're dealt with, and we've got to play. Well, unfortunately, if I could put together, if if somebody had the wherewithal to put together an algorithm back years ago that would do the calculation on how this would all end out, it would have had, the end result would have had catastrophe written all over it, and maybe we would have changed our minds there. But my concern is this, the economics being what they are in the country, which are, you know, suggested to be at their 
highest peak they've been in history. The town's ability right now, whether you can argue the point whether we're doing financially better than we have been in the past, my goal as a board member when I got on here was to try to catch up from all the backlog of things that I felt the municipality was behind on. And again, I uh, keep beating this horse, but infrastructure was one of those big items. Uh, you know, we've made huge accomplishments with the building here, the new fire departments, and slowly we've been, over the last 15 years, we've been making some substantial headway, and I'm just afraid of, uh, you know, this boulder rolling in front of us and stopping or slowing us down from, from that uh, progress uh, because I think once that happens, we're going to lose a lot of headwind and uh, we're going to, you know, fall back behind even further uh, because if the economy starts to tank in the next, you know, this can't go on forever. We all know that the economy just cannot continue it's upsurge like it is and whether it's two years from now four years from now i'm really pushing out you know at some point we're going to start to go the other way so for the ability for us to try to make headway then is going to be even way tougher than it is now and this issue here uh could in have a, a big impact in that in that ability so that's where i'm coming from if it's all right with you, I'm going to excuse myself and go back home to my kids. Um, if you have any other questions or need anything, let me know. I'm, I'm curious as to where you land on this, but by way of uh, boundaries, I'm going to go home. Yeah. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for coming, James. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your shoelace. Oh, you know, Carl, if I fall and hurt myself, then I can go to the hospital instead of the board meeting. On <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Yeah, yes. really. <laughs> Thanks again, James. No problem at all. I'm happy to help. Um, Bill, back to your comment on who would um, pen this letter. I know we've had you pen other letters for other. So is this something that if, if I made a motion um, along the lines of basically that we as a town have concerns surrounding affordability and would hope that the board consider options that limit or or limit increase on you know, expenditure increases or tax increases. However, I don't know which one would be better. And then um, the comment on um, considering options surrounding consolidation should be should be considered. Is that something that you think you could pen? Yeah, I can probably do that. Um, so their meeting is Wednesday night. Right. It's Monday night now. So that means we got to do this tomorrow or Wednesday. Yeah, and I apologize. We have to come that. back in and yes. sign. Yes. So you know, well, there's two. There's too. two choices, and it's up to you. Um, I can write the letter and email it to you all. Um, and I really don't want you know five emails back with a whole list of corrections from everybody. It's basically, yeah, this is something I can support, or no, it isn't. Um, and we could either, you could either make a motion, what you just said, and authorize me to send a letter to the board, and I'll send it to you first, and, and you can say thumbs up or thumbs down, or um, I'll send a letter to all of you, and if the majority say yeah, thumbs up, then you can come in on Wednesday sometime and sign it, and I'll get it to them before their meeting Wednesday night. So Not either. all at once. We could just come in throughout the day. and Yeah, okay. yeah just throughout the day. Um, I'll make that motion. For which option, then? <laughs> well, basically, the option is that um, Bill pen the letter. Um, as long as we all approve it, I guess via email, we all come in on Wednesday and sign. So you'll sign you'll the board. So I'll write a letter for the board to sign. Right. So you say with, all. You mean the majority or all? Well, don't you need board. just just a, you don't need everybody to sign it. Just a you need a quorum. Right. Three people. I guess that's what I'm asking you, Bill. 
what would you rather see? Well, it's, you know, I mean, it's, to, it's how, to, it's to send a better message. You wanted, yeah, exactly. You know, if, yeah. if all of you sign it, it says it's better. Yeah. more than yeah. if one of you signs it, you know. Um, well, I just, three of you sign it. I mean, if three it, sign it, will people over there say, well, only three fifths of the board right. supports it? Right. So if you can't all sign, you know, that's, that's your choice. Well, I just didn't know and, how and, the availability know, can, for everybody to I can to email meet it. And uh, if you want, uh, you can all print it off and sign it and then email it back to me if you want. And then it can go over there with each individual if you can't all sign it. But that's less of a... Well, just to be technical, um, I'll second the motion. <laughs> because we probably should discuss without a second. But um, I do want to add my two cents. Um, School budgets are always a tough issue with me, and I kind of a little bit agree with Chris. I think we have a lot of things that we have to deal with locally as a town. I'm very pro-education, but I'm also, I come from an era where school budgets were a little more manageable. Uh, people did, I think, more with less. And sometimes I think we need to go back to basics. And some of that is partially, can we afford the number of schools that we have now? You know, they've talked about closures. Can we afford all, I don't know if we can provide all the services that everyone wants. Uh, I think that it's a tough choice. Everyone, everyone wants services for their kids. And I always think, I wanna see kids have a great education. But also I say sometimes you can't afford everything you want because you're going to put a lot of people into very hard situations that they just can't afford their taxes anymore. They're going to either have to leave. I've seen a lot of my friends leave out of the state because of that reason. And I think part of, maybe that's something I think part of the reason that we need to, in this letter, draft uh, something that's saying, yes, we're concerned about affordability here within town. And, you know, the school board has to look at what the expenditures are and be considerate of that. Yeah. And I think if, I think of a well-crafted letter, and I do agree, I think it should be unanimous because I think we should be going as a full board with five people you know, or either saying either that or not not do it at all. Well, that's that's why I think we should focus on affordability and consolidation. As long as maybe we're all in agreement on those two topics, I think if right. we say anything, I don't, I wouldn't support personally anything in the letter stating, in, including programs for considering cuts on that. I just don't know enough about this to consider right. myself knowledgeable on it, and I feel like. The school board hopefully has enough people that can make those considerations. But if we're just trying to at least direct them in, in down in, in to at least the fiscally responsible option of five or something like five, that's where maybe just those two topics are enough to to at least maybe move the needle a little bit. Those are the big things. Yeah. But to to your point about you know people um, leaving and everything else, I mean. People need to remember that the people who show up are the ones who decide. And I just asked Carla, I said at normal town meeting, you know, what percentage of the checklist votes? Well, between 30 and 40 percent. Well, probably far less, but if there's something yeah, like a presidential primary. If it's a presidential, a I would say maybe that's yeah. right. So you, you got that. 10%. You have the, that this year. So, you know. For the people who can't afford it, if they really can't afford it, they should come out and vote no. I agree. No, that, and that's the difficult part because, you know. Well, this is an Australian ballot vote for school budget. Yeah. So you don't even have to, you know, get up and tell somebody that you're. Right. They get to the point where they're so race. frustrated they pack their bags and leave and they're so pissed off at everybody because they were forced to have to do that when they won't take the five minutes to get off their ass and come down and vote. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, they, they kind of get what's coming to them. And, and, but unfortunately, uh, 
you're probably not going to change that anytime soon. So a motion's been made and seconded. Um, obviously, we've had plenty of discussion. If there's no more, um, I'd take a, a, a vote on all those in favor of Bill drafting a letter. Say aye, please. Aye. 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 And again, I apologize, Bill, for this coming about all of a sudden, but uh, it was kind of... I was I, you know, I, throwing I, my lap over the weekend. I didn't but vote. It was, um, uh, I'm not going to be available on Wednesday, and I don't think I'm going to be able to sign the letter. So, um, you know, I think if you want to sign the send the letter and with four signatures. Yeah, that's that was one of my concerns. Yes, that's what I recommend. Where will you be? Anywhere around? No. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say I could bring the letter to you. <laughs> But well, I'm working and then I'm traveling, so oh, okay. okay. All right. So enough of that. That's taken up a fair amount of our time. Um, I guess we'll jump into manager's items. And the first thing on that list is revitalizing Waterbury's funding request. Karen, please. And sorry for the delay. I appreciate the apology. Um, Report. For your reading pleasure, you do not need to read it now. It is in almost finalized form as it'll, the board will approve it tomorrow. We don't have that. It was written today. And I also have a quick little graphic that um, sort of summarizes our past three years of our income um, revenue streams so that you can see how uh, your support relates to um, the rest of what RW does. So as in my letter, um, RW is here to request basically level funding from our, uh, from for really the past seven years of support. Um, You've supported Revitalizing Waterbury with a uh, contribution uh, in the general funds of $17,000. That uh, consists of $12,000, $1,000 payment to our RW for general operating dollars, and $5,000 for marketing and promotional and branding support um, for the town of Waterbury. Uh, you've also um, have uh, supported us with uh, an economic development, uh, we have an MOU for economic development services. Uh, that's $53,160. That has um, been to hire and became the economic development director. And uh, you know her, Alyssa Johnson. And the work she's done is beginning to we're beginning to see some the fruition of, of having her and Zoe before her, um, the work that they've, been, uh, they've done, and just bringing their decisions, supporting their decisions in our town. And uh, there's a request to make sure that you continue to fund the $5,000 in the planning department beautification budget. There's Steve right there, who is awesome when it comes to supporting our W in uh, both that area. Um, I can answer questions. I can give you some highlights from our annual report. Uh, I can discuss how our budget relates um, to previous years. It looks like your membership has gone down a little bit. Can, would you want to talk about that? So we, um, uh, yes, it has, and uh, we find that um, that's something that the board has uh, expressly decided to uh, really focus on. Um, with the hiring of the economic development director, our focus has been very much in towards businesses, and uh, we find that uh, local residents uh, don't necessarily feel as connected to RWs as they have in the past, and we're working to change that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, business memberships have been decreasing a little bit, but we see that as a direct relation to the impact of Main Street reconstruction on their businesses. 
And therefore, um, for example, this past year, I saw a major donation from um, Jay McDonald um, asking them, can you support us so we can support our businesses because they're not going to be able, they won't be able to come up with their own um, uh, business membership dollars. And with that money, we were able to support all the work that we normally do for so we see that it's, things are, will, will shake out uh, once the construction's done. We do see <coughs> this coming years is going to be tough for a lot of businesses. And, uh, so one of the reasons our 2020 budget is, it's a, I've made a note here, it's an amazingly conservative budget. The board really doesn't want to um, budget for things we don't have. We don't want to budget. For Chris, this is spread up your line. <laughs> we don't want to spend money we don't have on projects um, until we know we can do it. We don't take out a budget, we don't take out a project without a funding source and knowing how it's going to be paid for. So um, we feel that this is a really uh, strong budget, uh, one we absolutely can live within. And um, the reason I gave you these numbers of a budget versus actually, you can see how we truly, every year we budget conservatively and in you know, the last two years, we brought in extra twenty, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to manage projects and activities that we were we're doing, which um, and that money comes from a variety of sources. Uh, it's one of the things that I spend my time doing. My main connection working with different businesses, um, foundations, organizations to make this happen. So the individual line item is that uh, like a J. McDonald. Contribution. To That's a good question. So actually, individuals is a misnomer. Maybe we should change it because it's how my budget's built. Um, individuals are vendor fees. It's raffle sales. It's uh, all the little bitty things that come in for anything else that's not a membership. Is that so, like the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, admission to the um, Stowe Arts? Yes. So, the, so that's um, th that's the, the ten block, bucks each. The block par party gate yeah. um, comes in under there. Okay. I might it might come in as a cash. I don't actually identify it as a single person, but um, okay. or at all any silent auction sales uh, or a mm -hmm. raffle tickets, but also vendor fees when we have for the arts fest. Uh, you know, costs a vendor seventy five dollars to be at the arts fest if they're not a corporate business. Um, often it's just person um, that falls there. So is the, excuse me, is the membership money then either from businesses or individuals? Yes. Okay. So the membership dollars are both individuals and businesses. So up at the top is corporations. Corporations are also businesses, but they've been, they paid me uh, for cooperative fees or those are sponsorships, um, different kinds of uh, money that has come in, for example, J.A. McDonald's donation to us in 2019 would show up under corporations. Whereas the, um, for example, in 2019 foundations, um, that consists of two, uh, two um, grants that we sought. Um, actually, they both came from National Life. They were different, different revenue streams. I plan on applying for an, the grant again to National Life. We've gotten money from the Arts Council or from our community foundation, um, things like that. Or actually like Albertsons, that's Shaw's. <laughs> They'll give me money and that shows up under as a foundation donation. Question, your government line item, I'm assuming that's the whole town contribution. Town of Waterbury. So do you ever go after other governmental <coughs> like <coughs> grants and stuff like that? Um, the fact is, not generally. We will work in concert with, like, with Barb to seek um, to support grants from the town that will benefit us in a, a different way. So, for example, what's not included in here is the Main Street money that is coming from the state of Vermont through Waterbury. Um, it's funding. It, it's a different project. That's sort of a, it's a project that money comes in and the money goes out. It's a zero sum game for revitalizing Waterbury. Um, so we don't, it's not listed in here. This is our general operating dollars. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'll just come in and, and raving support of you guys and feeling that I think 
the money we spend as a town goes a long way just through your volunteer network. Oh. And I think that um, I really enjoy this partnership and I think it's something that um, we're seeing the real fruits of um, on a daily basis. So I just want to say thank you for all the work you guys do. I appreciate it. And I will say that um, it's a we. There's a team of people um, who are employed by Revitalize Waterbury at this time. It's Karen Evans, Executive Director, Alyssa Johnson, the um, Economic Development Director, and we have hired a part-time marketing assistant, Ariel Lanla. All three of us work together in conjunction with volunteers. And in this room, there are one, two, three, four volunteers, Revitalize Waterbury volunteers. <laughs> and um, that makes a real uh, difference because we can't do it by ourselves. So. I've said it a hundred times before. Thank, thank God for the volunteerism that the town has uh, had over the years. Uh, or I don't know where we'd be without it. Yeah. So Alyssa's uh, uh, portion of this budget uh, looks like just looks like you may be taking that position and putting it into a full-time position is that so the $56,160 pays for her salary it pays for um the uh, taxes of the you know the, those kind of things it also pays for a portion of her rent her telephone and her um uh, she has a small budget of expenses that are associated with the Waterbury Area Development Committee. Uh, she gets some professional uh, professional development dollars, about $500 on that, to attend conferences. Uh, her budget this year has money to support um, doing a second job fair, Central Vermont Job Fair, uh, and uh, money for bringing uh, uh, business consultants in to do workshops for businesses. So the, Fifty-three thousand one sixty isn't just her salary; it is her salary plus some additional um, expenses that are associated uh, with um, the economic development. But it is a full-time job, and it, it, ha full and it has job. been for way uh, back before yeah. Alyssa was here. Zoe was the first; year. she was hired as a full-time employee. Yes. So also, maybe I was mis misunderstanding because it says for the final nine months of the year. So, so no, no, that's in my, that's in my memo. No, no, so, I understand that. Okay. Just. So in 2000, in 2019, we paid $4,300 a month for January, February, and March. If you notice on Karen's request, her request is for 53160 for the period April 1st through March 31st. I was wondering. And uh, basically, last year we went from forty-three hundred to forty-four thirty, I think. And now the request is level funded, so there's no increase. We've been paying forty-four thirty since April, and the increase this year is flat. It's just that it's twelve months this year at forty-four thirty, as opposed to last year it was three months at forty-three hundred. And nine months at forty-four thirty. I see. We asked for a small increase to give salary increases last year. This year we're level funded. Well, speaking of that, I gotta I gotta tell you the other the last meeting we had there when John Malter was here, um, and he talked about what took place with his wage increase uh, and then a, a cut in hours, which. The end result was he was earning less. That just that hit me too hard uh, to see that there's people out there that you know those types of things are happening to, uh, and then they have to go on continuing to try to you know make a living here and, and stay here. Uh, that, that was pretty tough to swallow there last week. So. Um, Everything looks great. I um, appreciate all your efforts. Uh, if I had more time in my life, I might be a member as well. <laughs> um, You'll take your money. <laughs> <they're not. laughs> well, I just $30 became. Thirty dollars is all it takes yeah. to be a member of Revitalizing Waterbury. I'll, I'll think about it. I just became a member of the uh, Vermont Chamber of Commerce here a little while, ago, a week ago, and. Uh, so, You'll get more out of revitalizing Waterbury. Yeah, perhaps. And I, the truth may, is, I may. Um, 
a lot of times businesses will weigh between Vermont Chamber of Commerce, Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce and Revitalizing Waterbury, and they join RW because they get, all, you know, first of all, they can walk in the door and find us. And we answer questions, and we do like work, and we work for you. Um, and, uh, and the town is, and we're launching an amazing program to support Main Street this year. And uh, uh, please read the report. I think the report is, um, once we put it all together, it's like, whoa, we really did all that. And we're, I'm pretty proud of the work we did. Well, I mentioned earlier there to you guys that maybe this next year I can participate in some form of incentive to get people to come into town and air. So we're going to work on it. Still, yeah. still looking to Congress. talk to you about that. Yes. Okay. okay. Any, any more questions? Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Sorry to keep you waiting. Mr. Dillon, you get sick of being here yet? You've been here in the last few After meetings. After all these years? Yeah, right. Yeah. Another night. Okay. So again, um, you know, fire department budget, uh, I sent it out to you over the weekend. Uh, there's a 5% increase in spending proposed right now. Um, and I sent you kind of the details of Gary's budget. Um, I think, uh, Gary, you certainly can say whatever you need to say. I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about what you talked with me concerning the new equipment a couple of sure. weeks ago, the uh, SCBA stuff and yeah. the like. So. So prior to, really prior to the merger of the two departments, um, and I, I can't speak for what the town did because I'm, I'm really not sure, but in the village we, we purchased so many air packs each year to replace them because they have to be inspected, they have to pass, and they, there's an expiration date. doesn't mean that they won't work. doesn't mean that they're really not safe. But the people that are doing the inspections say we're not certifying it. So then if there's an issue, um, NIOSH or whoever's going to come in and say, eh, boy, this wasn't inspected or didn't pass inspection because there's no sticker on it. So we had uh, a process to turn those over. Same with air bottles. Um, the difference between the air packs and the air bottles is the air bottles, once they expire, they, they dead end expire. You can't fill them. Period. So even though they might be good for the next 20 years, you don't know that because um, you just can't fill them. So when we merged, uh, prior to the merger, I guess, the town got a grant and they purchased a fire truck and they purchased a number of air pipes and a lot of air bottles. Um, and over the last for five years, we kind of realized that we we're coming up to a huge expense uh, to replace those air bottles because they're over $2,000 a piece. And the, the problem was that um, we had to play catch up to replace those bottles, even though our packs technically didn't pass inspection. I talked with the people that were checking them. They said that they're fine, they work, they're safe, but we can't put a sticker on them. But if you choose to use them, you can use them. Bottles, on the other hand, when they expire, they just expire, period. There is no, eh, let's fill them anyways. Um, you can't. So we have been scrounging over the last four or five years to replace, I think it was 45 bottles. Um, and we didn't get that many because we don't we don't necessarily need that many on top of the ones that we had in the village. So we did cut back, but we also had to replace a big chunk of them. So we didn't buy any air packs, and we finally got to the point this past year where we're good with the air bottles. We're going to get those into a rotation, um, like we do with our gear and everything else, so that we can have a smoother transition 
year to year of replacing air packs, replacing bottles, replacing gear, replacing everything else that we have. So that it's, I don't know, I guess, at least predictable. Um, and a fairly consistent right. expenditure level. Right. How, how long do the bottles last? <coughs> well, it depends on what you get. Um, but for the most part, they're uh, either 14 uh, years or 20 years. And some of the high-end ones that we don't get are significantly less, but they're smaller and they're much lighter. We could, although I would never uh, at this point, I would not recommend it. We could get a steel bottle that, as long as it passes hydro test every few years, it is good forever. The problem is that it's a steel bottle and it is heavy. And we, we don't use those. We have a couple that we use for uh, airbags, when, for lifting. Um, but nobody's got to wear that on their back. And they're, they're I don't say, twice as heavy, but they're close to twice as heavy as the composite bottles that we use that are... Do the air packs last about as long as the bottles? The air packs, well, again, it depends on whether or not you're going to stop using it when it expires. Um, right. So, but there is a, an, an expiration. No, they, they last less than some of the bottles. Um, so that's where we got to. We For the last few years, we've been replacing bottles and not replacing packs like we used to do prior to the merger. I think the merger was the best thing that we could have done, but we, we paid for that. Um, so now um, I've met with Bill and said, you know, we're behind eight ball. Now that we've got the bottles taken care of, we need to start focusing on the packs. And I'm sensitive to the fact that we just approved two trucks, although we got trucks, the highway department, if, you, if you're buying a new grader, that doesn't mean that they still don't have the other things that they've got to do to work as well. Um, but I am sensitive to that. Um, and I'm sensitive to the taxpayers who say, geez, we just spent all this money on trucks. Why are you asking for additional funds? Now, if you, if you look at it, it's really not a huge jump. Um, and there are also other things in the budget that add to this cost, like um, you'll see it in there, there's a gear extractor. It's $5,000. Now, what is it? It's a very high efficient washing machine. Uh, not efficient in that it uses less water, it's efficient in that it truly extracts all the, the carbons and crap that's in the gear that really are known to cause cancer. Um, and so we bought one last year that you can essentially wash half your gear, um, one person's gear, uh, in that. And it really extracts all the bad stuff that's in it. Um, so that you know, if I were to wash my gear after a, a building fire and you know, I, I put it in a, a regular washing machine, it doesn't extract all the bad stuff that's in it. But we know that the stuff that's in our gear literally does cause cancer. So on top of the, the uh, air patch, you'll see that that is you know, another high priced item. It's $5,000. The gear is something that we replace every year. Um, actually, I, I dropped that amount this year uh, a little bit. So you know, that's on a rotating cycle. Correct. So, so it's a third or a quarter or whatever it is. Right. So the gear is good for 10 years. You might have, you know, uh, Stan Morris who goes to more fires because of his the, the time that he's allowed, and he's a very active interior firefighter, and a couple others that we replace their gear before it expires because of the wear and tear. So it's not. It's not just the year and how old it is, it's the condition that it's in. And I've got uh, an equipment officer that is a spreadsheet guru. So all of our gear is on his spreadsheet. And as soon as it hits 2020, some of the line items, some of the items on those members go red, which means they have to be replaced. Others go yellow. And 
then he takes a look at it with our vendor at everybody's gear and says, okay, this is how much this is going to cost to fix this coat. Um, but it's only going to be good for one more year. So it makes sense just to replace it a year earlier and not fix it and then have to throw it away the following year. So there's quite a process in doing that. I'm glad that he's the one that's doing it because I could never figure out how to do a spreadsheet like that. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm aware that it's an increase, um, but it's, it's not foolish increase money. It's stuff that is going to make the firefighter safer. Um, I certainly wouldn't stand here and say that none of our members, by using this new machine, this extractor, are going to get cancer, because I can't say that. Um, it's, it's always out there. There's a presumptive act. Uh, the career firefighters have been pushing for it for a long time. I think it's passed in Vermont. It says if they get certain types of cancer, it's presumed that it was on the job. Uh, some departments have gone so far as saying when they get done at a fire, their gear has to come off them. They put it in a bag and they ride back on the truck with the clothing that they had underneath them. Um, we just don't have that luxury. There are departments around that have two complete sets of gear. So every individual member has a set, two sets of gear. Um, we don't. Would I like to be in that position? Yes. But when you're paying over $600 for a pair of pants, $1,200 for a coat, um, I don't think you want to see what that bill would cost. Because it would be significant. Gary, is there, I don't know if it, there's any money left in that month, but lady money, there was grant money for first responder equipment like the packs and stuff like that. You know, I don't know if we're eligible or, or not for that, but it seems like some of this kind of the extractor, you know, the especially the packs would be something that would be eligible for that Leahy grant money. Um, I've, I've not heard of Leahy grant money. Um, could be. But I, I would look into it. Um, so it was like, I have, I've office. never, I mean, I get emails um, from uh, Ms. Pirro from uh, Senator Sanders' office, and she also works for Senator Leahy, and she's never mentioned any Leahy grant money. She always refers to the other grant money, which we really well, most of the, have a hard time getting. It's, we're, we're eligible for anything that right. we're eligible for, but the, the challenge is that there are so many volunteer fire departments that have zero budgets that, you know, we look at Waterbury's budget at, you know, close to $750,000 a year, and we don't score high on the list. No, we can no. try, and there's no, no harm yeah. in trying. But That's what I'm saying. It doesn't hurt to ask. Well, it, no, it doesn't hurt to ask. Except but it who's going to do the paperwork. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, oh, I know grant writing is no fun. Well, but we also um, don't have a town that has a grant writer. So that means people have to sit down and try and write these grants, and you're, you're competing against grant writers. I um, understand. And and sometimes just sitting down and with a book and a manual and going through it and People, I've seen people who are not professional grant writers get grants as, as much as the professionals. Sure, sure. Um, and again, uh, it's, it's a lot of time. Yeah. And, you know, how much time do you ask of your volunteers? And, and you know, we... That's why we're volunteers. Out. What's that? That's why people are volunteers. They well, just use the They're willing to roll up their sleeves. Well, but they already do. They, they I do. understand. You know, we're not talking about volunteering on a Saturday to go around, and I'm not minimizing anything that anybody else does. I think Waterbury looks great with Garland and stuff. But they're volunteering to go out there and, and hang that. And our volunteers are getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and risking their lives. And going to fires or other incidents. Um, more dangerous, I think, are, is going up on the interstate during the winter. So they're already putting in time. And... I had one member who's very bright, came to me and he wanted to put in and work on a grant. And he came down, I think he might have talked to Steve or Bill, uh, John Petrowski, and he was getting information and he realized that it was literally hours and hours 
We're talking not 10 or 20 hours, we're talking 80, 120 hours of work. And I think it's unreasonable to have volunteers sitting down and, and, and we put in for grants. We've had committees, and I've been on committees, and we've, we've gotten grants. But they're harder and harder now. This, you know, 9-11 is long over, and, and unfortunately people have forgotten. And back then the money was, they were literally just giving it out. And some departments were taking money that they should not have been taking. And Waterbury got money, but it was money well spent, even though we paid the price and had to catch up on the air bottles, uh, and now the air packs. But it's not as, it's not as, in my mind, as simple as just saying, hey, there's grant money, let's just go get it. It's, it's sitting down and... No, it's a, I understand it's a competitive process. Yeah, and, and again, there are volunteers, but a lot of those volunteer departments have people out in the communities that write grants that sit down for them. Um, I don't know anybody in Waterbury, that, in fact, I know nobody in Waterbury who is a grant writer has, has not come to me and said, hey, I'd like to write grants for you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I, I certainly understand, but when you're competing against, you know, the likes of Burlington and Rutland and St. Johnsbury and Brattleboro and South Burlington, in Montpelier, in Barrie, and they have people that, that's what they do is write grants. It's, it's a challenge. Um, for some reason, I, and maybe she's limited in that capacity, but I thought that's kind of what Barb did, no? Is well, that, she's done some grant writing, yeah. But that's not her, that wouldn't be something that she, that she has either the time or, or would it be unreasonable to even walk that path? Well, um, I'm not sure at this point, you know, she, she has, we pay her for 24 hours a week, and she gave me a, a budget today that tells me what she's going to do for whatever that equals, 1,260 hours in the year, and if there's 80 more hours, we're going to have to pay her 80 more hours, so, you know, how much are you going to... Yeah. Let, let me at least make a few calls for you to see if one money is directly available and what the process would be. And you know, I'd be willing to help. It, you know, I know something yeah. about grants. I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to anybody helping. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to be very careful about volunteering volunteers to yeah. sit down and spend a lot of time writing grants. Um, and that's, that's it. So. Unfortunately, in some cases, our tax dollars are a lot easier taken from us than they're given back to us, you know. And there's reasons for it. Um, yeah, and, you know, part of me is, you know, what are we applying for? And, you know, I try and be uh, a little sensitive to the departments out there. And I go to mutual aid meetings, we're going this coming Wednesday. There are departments in our own mutual aid meeting that have virtually nothing squad and they put it for grants and I I don't know that I could go to the next mutual aid meeting and look him in the eye and say yeah we got fifty thousand dollars for this and they didn't get any money and they need it uh, so yeah, good for Waterbury I get it um, but you know there are departments out there that are, that are really hurting so as I said right at the start uh, you know, that's the big ticket item really in this budget in terms of an increase. You can see on what I sent out the other day, it's highlighted in yellow down at the bottom. It's a 50% increase over what we budgeted last year. And it's uh, even a higher percentage of what we spent. Um, Gary, have you, do you know if you've turned in all your bills yet? No, I just got the last uh, two bills emailed to me at about three o'clock, um, it's uh, I wrote the, the amounts down, so it's uh, four thousand, uh, just over five thousand dollars for together, total together um, okay. for coats and cans. So that'll push the seven twenty nine up to about seven thirty five. Then, and there's a few other small putbacks that we may get yet, but. Um, 
right now, from a budget to budget basis, this is a 5% increase. Um, There's with, also the, that adds to the bottom line, um, is the building maintenance contract with Heinwell. Yeah, I was going to ask, I saw that, that jump, that was my question. Yeah, the 70% increase, I'm sorry. And yeah, Bill Woodruff, the public works director, came to me, talked with Gary, and um, there's a, a contract with Honeywell to do some of the, uh, uh, you know, general mechanical maintenance that needs to be done. It's, it's uh, something I think that it makes good sense for us to do to have it on a regularly scheduled maintenance uh, rather than wait until there's, uh, there's a, a problem. So it's a $14,000 uh, budget for that for, uh, for a year. Honey, Honeywell, are we talking like HVAC yeah. yeah. type yeah. stuff? Correct. So a, a very timely thing this morning, uh, one of our members works out of this fire station on Mondays and Fridays so he doesn't have to commute to work and uh, he got there this morning and the heat was off and it was 50 degrees in there so contacted the, the Honeywell rep and, and fortunately for us he's also one of our firefighters but there's a there's a process I mean we not anybody can just call him you know, otherwise everybody would call him so it, at 5 30 this morning we're doing uh, you know, texting to, to have him stop there first on his way out of town and uh, fix the heating system, which was easy for him. Maybe not so easy for me. Right. Um, but it's also replacing filters. Um, the right. the uh, air purifying filters that we have, six of them at Main Street, three of them at Maple Street. It filters out the carcinogens and the carbon monoxide when we start the trucks and pull them out. Uh, they kick on. They're both designed a little bit differently. They kick on and purify the air. Those filters are expensive. They're a few thousand dollars when you buy those. There's, there's three stages. Um, so um, Matt kind of grumbled about it there earlier, and I'll ask about it now. The, the uh, dispatching there jumped a little bit. Um, is that, I don't recall what it was. Well, you got to have it here somewhere, right, from last year. It was seventy-three thousand dollars last year. It's going to be seventy-nine six this year. And the number that Gary had on his on his uh, sheet, if you look at it, he had eighty-one eight sixty. But um, I think what Gary did was multiply the new rate times four quarters. So we have two quarters at the current rate. Then on July first, it goes up, uh, and the seventy-nine six ten. You know, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but if we tried to have our own dispatching, uh, you know, it's 24-7. You'd need four people anyway to be dispatchers and, and, you know, to cover vacations and off. I mean, you need three people for three shifts a day for eight hours, or two people if you have 12-hour shifts and you're paying a lot of overtime for that. So. You know, it looks like a lot of money, but if we tried to pay for it ourselves, uh, we'd be paying two hundred thousand dollars for it. So. Yeah, I was just trying to get an idea, a sense of whether that was a, uh, a typical increase year to year. Is, is that a is that a private entity? Uh, it's the city of Montpelier, basically. So the this there's Capital West uh, Mutual Aid District. Gary can yeah. get the name better than I can. And, and that's the organization of the fire departments in central Vermont, uh, ambulance squads and the like. Uh, and then that organization contracts with the city of Montpelier, I believe, to provide this dispatching. So Montpelier dispatches for their own fire and police and ambulance, and then they also dispatch for Capital West. Right. So Montpelier Police is the is the dispatch location and the dispatchers are paid by the police department. Montpelier Fire and Ambulance are part of the capital mutual aid system. So they actually, they're paying, they're paying through the mutual aid system um, for the dispatching service. Uh, 
the equipment that's there is co-owned by Montpelier Police and Capital Fire Mutual Aid System. Um, and on top of paying for the dispatching, the Capital Fire Mutual Aid pays to maintain and change towers around. Um, so, and that's, that's a lengthy process in itself because you've got to get FAA and then Canada pipes up and says no because they have the right to restrict what we do over our air. Um, but you know, it, it's, there's a lot involved in, it's not just paying for the dispatching, there's maintaining the towers that cost money each year. Um, it's moving towers, the one in Waterbury is going to get moved. It's, it's also needs to be pointed out that 79610 for 2020 includes the dispatching for WASI as well. Um, years back, we put it all in the fire budget just so we could all see it, and WASI paid the town money for dispatching. So it was like a, you know, a $40,000 dispatching bill, and WASI was paying $22,000 or $24,000. And that continued until after the flood, and then they came in and asked, could you please pay for all the dispatching? We did that, and now last year, you know, they've asked us for almost $40,000 a year, but the per capita that we pay recognizes the fact that we're paying the dispatching for them already. Otherwise, our per capita with them would be almost twice as much as it is. Yeah, and they certainly have significantly more calls or service than, than we do, and they're uh, probably average maybe three or four a day. Uh, so they have a lot of incidents, a lot of calls. So back to the building maintenance line item. Um, outside of the internal mechanics of the building, is there any portion of that, or do you anticipate like exterior painting and other things like that having to be done uh, and, and is that building maintenance cover any portion of that issue? I mean, uh, last time I was up there, which I think was last last summer when I was looking at Thurston's drainage problem there, um, I was noticing that that looks like the exterior of the building starting to wear a little bit. Um, so no, right now, it it doesn't, um, you know, the building maintenance is the fire alarm, the overhead door maintenance, the Honeywell contract that we just talked about, uh, road inspections, sprinkler inspections, elevator service, janitorial services, um, cascade system, you can tell them what that is. That's the system that fills the air bottles. Um, but you're right, Chris, it, it is starting to show signs. We've done it once. Right. About the midway point, we had it uh, redone, uh, repainted, and re-lined. Right. I don't know what it is you do with those buildings. I'm not a contractor. Right. Um, but probably next year, the year after, we probably get a, a quote to, to do that right. again. Yeah. I was going to say we already did that one time, Correct. I believe. So um, it's not like we're just neglecting it. No, I just I just want to. Yeah. Keep so it, it is on the radar. Keep up with it. Yeah. Uh, the only. Th okay thing that we would probably do this coming summer is at Main Street. Uh, it's early enough that it won't really be a big deal. The, the metal door, walk-through door in the front, and then the door going from that hallway into the apparatus bay has some surface rust. And we, we're going to try and find a uh, portable sandblaster that can come there and not just because I could sand it down, but it doesn't amount to squat. Um, have somebody come in and sandblast it, get it down, reprime it, and repaint it before we have to replace a whole door case. Yeah. So anyway, I know that we're a long way yet from knowing how everything melds together, but I would recommend that we tentatively approve this budget tonight at this $780-695 level. And if we have to come back, um, you know, I did increase the money that we're sending to the capital reserve funds by 4%. Um, we could trim that a little bit if we had to. Um, Bill, can we focus on that for real quick? Because you did mention yeah. that in your letter. Um, yeah. 
you know, we make a decision to buy two trucks outside of the CIP, those debt service payments, is that what's sitting there on the line, two lines above? So those, those principal and interest payments would increase based on those bonds associated, or not bonds, but the loans associated with? No, so the, the debt principal and interest that is here on the fire department budget is the principal and interest for the bond for the fire station itself. Mm -hmm. The, the money that gets transferred to the capital improvement plan, uh, that funds, you know, towards trucks and pays the debt service on any trucks that we have purchased. Okay. Yeah, because that was my question of if we were going to see an increase because we took it on loan if it made sense to drop CIP, but if it's under CIP, then yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. loans sort of, the loans for the vehicles are in the capital budget, so we've got to fund that. And my other quick question is on the Duxbury contract. I think a couple of weeks ago or maybe even longer, we is that when we basically told Duxbury what they needed to pay us? So at the, at the last meeting, uh, when you were not here, the board approved the contract um, $114,100 um, and my recommendation to them was even though that contract amount was based on an estimated year-end number and our year-end number is going to be slightly higher than the estimate but even if we recalculated it based on the actual number it looks like it might have been $800 higher and for $800 and everything that they got going on over there, I'd rather not stir that pot. So <laughs> I think it's, I think it'd be fine. Um, on the last page of the uh, equipment and um, yep. breakdown, how do we come up with the 32780 difference? I don't come up I with that. I think that's number. the difference between the two different grand totals, and then there was a, I was looking at that too, there was a 10,000. Uh, the difference between those two numbers is 40,290. Right. And there was a. Yeah, there was that a, that was, that's my error. Oh. So that didn't change that bottom number. That, that, so the, the, the bold number 230, 665, and the 19370, I have automatically calculated in here, and that was just my own pushing of buttons. Okay. Um, yeah, like and then, then a couple things were changed up above right. that I didn't adjust down there. So right. okay. And, and then I took, I took Gary's numbers and they're different, the dispatching numbers, right. $4,000 less. So right now the budget to budget difference is $37,240. 37240 okay. I probably should have just taken that. I was using that when I was working on this. You said 37240 Mm-hmm, yep. Right now. Any more questions from the board? You uh, so you need a motion? Is that right? No, I don't need a motion. I was going to say. I mean, I we don't want to. That right, yeah, I wouldn't believe. But no, what kind of flashlights do it's you a pla It's a placeholder for right now. Yeah. They're, they're intrinsically safe. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I had a person ask me, uh, the reporter asked me about pagers. He goes, aren't pagers like $25? It's like, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Um, they're not. Just like our, our gloves are like $78 a pair. Um, you know, boots are... Uh, well, almost like the federal government. And, and yeah. thank goodness they are, Gary, right? Because when the, compared to the gloves that you had 30 years ago when I first got here, they're worth 78 bucks, right? Oh, there's no question. Uh, <laughs> I, I literally remember when I was new at a chimney fire on Bachelor Street, and I was pulling the chain up. I was, when I was young and didn't care about heights, uh, pulling the chain up from the chimney. And I, the gloves that I was issued were the bright orange, rubber-coated gloves, and as I'm pulling it up, 
I'm realizing the chain is slipping back down because these gloves are melting on my hands. And I thought, well, I guess I gotta find a different pair of work gloves. But, you know, it, it, the helmets, you know, it, you know, it's not a regular construction helmet. It's ballistically lined, uh, Kevlar lined, and they're depending on which style you, know, you get. You, we typically get ones that are around $350. Um, we have some members, including myself, that I've bought my own, but those are, um, you know, above $800. But I'm a traditionalist, and it's a traditional leather helmet. But they look like they're cumbersome to wear, too. They're, they're not comfortable at all after like four hours. Um, but I, I would encourage any of you that you really, you know, I'm sure at some point you've all been in one or both stations, but if you really want to get around and see what the stations and how they operate, give me a call. You can, you can, I can meet with you or you can come on a training night. Call me if you want to come on a training night because some of the required training is sitting in a classroom and that would be pretty anticlimactic for you. Aren't the majors becoming a thing of the past? Well, yeah, they're, they're very close. Um, we have apps that we have on our phones, right. um, but the pager will work where a phone won't work. Uh, okay, so like if you're in a dead zone, it's not Correct. Right. It'll still uh, work. Right. So who has pagers? Everybody. Everyone, okay. Just I saw there's only three. Three new ones, probably. Three new ones, right, right, right. right. Uh, so, yeah, um, you know, I can be in Island Pond if I forget to leave my pager home, and sometimes if the air is right, you know, my pager will go off and I'm in an island bond. Um, and, and then I quickly shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I think one thing on your comment too is I think after town meeting, I don't, I don't know if you've done it in the past, but I, I think it would be great if we try to do it as a board, and I don't know, you know if it just has to be warned, but it would be nice that we're all there seeing the same things, discussing the same things, instead of like on an individual. I, I think that's a great suggestion that we, we formalize that to a certain extent. I think that would be, I'd really enjoy that. I second that. Uh, I think it's a really good thing. I didn't even know how many pump trucks you had until a couple of years ago. Well, I think, I think what would make all the discussion of you coming here with the details really Stand come to life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, be happy to do it, just let me know. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Long wait, Steve, but it's your turn. Pretty used to being patient. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's fun. So again, um, in the information I sent out on Saturday, uh, you know, the planning budget is a very straightforward budget, uh, up 3.77 percent from last year and uh, I think most of the increase really is will be covered by uh, grant funding anyway but uh, I'll let Steve talk about his budget. Okay, sounds good. So Bill um, you know, sent you out the budget. Um, he also sent out a justification which um, has uh, changed somewhat because Bill always takes my numbers and uh, tweaks and, and changes. I mean the basic concept is there. So I think what I'd like to do is uh, go through the budget itself. Um, I won't really deal with the pay items other than uh, to say that, uh, as you know, Dina is now full-time. And um, I've formally become her supervisor. We're still in somewhat of a transition mode. But I think generally things are, are going well. It helps that we're not um, extremely busy right now. but. Um, so that, that transition, I, I think, is going well, and we're working closely with, with Bill on that. Um, we're both in the health insurance, um, so um, that's, that's helpful, and obviously there's a cost there. So I think what I'd like to do is go through the non-pay items, and then if Bill wants to come back to any of those items, you're welcome to ask questions about that. So I'll start down with the professional service item. And um, this is actually a combination of, of two things. We pay for uh, secretarial services for both the Planning Commission and the Development Review Board. Uh, Patty Martin, uh, formerly Patty Spence, um, is, she went back to her, uh, her maiden name. 
and Patty is, um, does, does a great job, so uh, we pay her $65 per meeting to do our minutes and, um, and keep up with that. And then uh, we have another project, which is um, the, the survey of the proposed Ferrars Edition Historic District, and uh, this is being done by Scott Newman. Uh, 106 Associates, he did the survey of the expanded Waterbury Village Historic District over 2017-2018. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so he's partway through that project. We were hoping to do it all uh, last year. Uh, he had some family circumstances come up. And um, so uh, we're basically going to be uh, splitting that project uh, between the two fiscal years, uh, fiscal 2019 and um, fiscal uh, 2020. So that's the other part of um, that. The reason for the reduction is just that, that um, we ended up just charging a portion of his contract, about half of his contract, 2019 the remaining will be done in 2020. Uh, he'll be bringing the uh, survey to you for a presentation, just like we did with the Waterbury Village historic district survey, so I think you'll find that very interesting. It's not as large an area, but has a very rich history. So uh, that, that will be coming back to you uh, probably in the spring. So uh, moving right along, the, under the special projects, uh, we, we still have uh, a few projects. One is uh, the reservoir, which is the so-called breeder program. It's funded by the state. It's a pass-through of state funds. Uh, it's officially the aquatic nuisance program uh, trying to uh, prevent uh, nuisance uh, invasive weeds. Uh, the reservoir has some invasives that are uh, more or less controlled by uh, dropping the reservoir in the, uh, in the winter. So we'll see how that goes when they bring up the level year-round, uh, which will happen once the dam improvements are all made. So uh, that's a pass-through of funds, and um, this will be their, um, I believe, their fifth year with that program, uh, it's Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Yeah, and just on that note, um, if you look over at 2019, you see that the budget for that project was $2,500. Uh, we had $2,500 in the revenue portion of the budget as well. As Steve said, it's an offset in and out. Uh, the grant was only $2,080, so that's all we spent was $2,080. They're going to ask for a $2,500 grant this year. But also be aware, from what I understand, the Friends of the Watery Reservoir are circulating a petition and they're looking for money. Yes, for but a special I article. think I understood from Chuck that it's not going to happen. Oh. Okay. They didn't get enough signatures? They just didn't start it soon enough. Okay. okay. So, scrap so that. Maybe next year. We'll, we'll see. But they're very active. It's a good, good organization. Uh, so, uh, we run along. The next project is uh, titled Trees. And uh, we have one project that we're partway through, and this is the Emerald Ash Borer Preparedness and uh, Management Plan. Uh, we talked to you about this project a little bit before. Uh, we hired uh, a natural resource forestry firm called Red Start out of our friends in Bradford. And uh, our tree committee has uh, met with their two foresters that are working on this project. Uh, we completed our roadside ash inventory. Now they're looking at um, how we can manage the ash. And uh, one piece of good news is that the state is coming up with a fund to assist assist with removal of ash in the roadsides. Uh, we want to get our, our management plan completed, uh, work with you on a strategy of how to deal with the ash, especially ones that are showing signs of going into poor condition. There's no emerald ash borer that has appeared to date in Waterbury, but it's in Montpelier, uh, Berrytown, Orange, uh, up in the islands. So it's definitely a, a presence in um, many parts of the state. Eventually, it's going to come to water. And it also could be here and just hasn't been detected yet. Yeah, it's hard to detect because it starts up in the uh, crowns of the trees. So, um, so this will be an ongoing project, and we'll uh, definitely keep you in the loop with the, uh, the management plan and 
what's recommended. Uh, treatment is an option for street trees or park trees. We don't have a lot of those, but um, we're already starting to treat. Uh, we treated one in the cemetery, in Hope Cemetery, this past year with a systemic uh, insecticide. The um, Green Elm Byway is a project that has been ongoing. It was funded through a grant, a federal grant, early on. And um, at this time, there is no federal grant money. There's legisl legislation to try to reestablish the program at the federal level. That might ultimately come with some, uh, some grant funds. But um, Waterbury and, uh, and Stowe, the original uh, towns, are working with uh, the four Lamoille County towns to our north and stretch from Morristown over to Cambridge. And um, we're working on revamping our, our website, expanding it to include those towns. So a request came uh, through our byway committee uh, that I co-chair for a $1,000 contribution from each town, which is basically maintaining the, uh, the website that we have. We'll also look at uh, creating uh, brochures, you may be familiar with the recreation guide, the Stowe and Waterbury Cultural Facilities Guide. Um, so we would like to create brochures for the four Lamont County towns. So it's a good, a good partnership uh, that's ongoing. Then um, moving into the other more operational funds, uh, legal service. Um, this is a, a really an item that fluctuates a fair bit year to year depending on the issues and whether we have appeals that are in court. Uh, this year we only spent about half of our budget, but uh, we like to keep a fairly robust uh, budget just um, in case we need legal services. We work with Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher. We've worked with them for years on land use um, issues. Uh, they're very good. They, they give us good advice and so on. And their, uh, their hourly rates are going up, too. I got okay. a call the other day from Joe. So. Yeah, I'm not surprised. They've been one of the most reasonable yeah, firms been, for us. It's been several years since they increased. Yeah. So um, telephone services, uh, we've got some econ economy because of the new uh, internet-based system. So that item is, um, is coming down. The system, I think, is generally working well. Uh, Postage fluctuates a bit, uh, so we're uh, we're not doing as many mailings. So we're about to do a large mailing. Um, I think you'd be interested in this uh, relating to the historic overlay district bylaws that the Planning Commission presented to you. We've scheduled a public hearing for February 10th. We're going to make sure you're invited to this Planning Commission public hearing, and we're, we are going to be sending letters to all of the landowners involved to make sure they're informed. Uh, so Mark, you'll get a letter. Um, Jane, you'll probably get a letter. But at any rate, um, so that, that's on the horizon. Uh, advertising, we advertise typically in the Waterbury Record. Uh, that's worked well. It's pretty reasonable. Um, I'm going to skip down. Beautification, uh, this is the item that Karen mentioned that um, helps support revitalizing Waterbury's program. Uh, the Garlands is one project we help fund out of that, but it also uh, helps fund the flowers and um, the uh, lighting for the, the uh, snowflakes that are on right now and uh, various items uh, like that. So um, we're working on Newton Baker Park, uh, doing some beautification there now that the interstate bridges are reconstructed. Jane is working on that. Then um, tr uh, training tuition, this pays for uh, Dina and me and board members to go to workshops. Uh, we encourage both the development review board members and the planning commission members to attend workshops. They often do. And um, also I'm involved with our three state uh, Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association as a treasurer of Vermont Planners Association. So I've been traveling over to uh, New Hampshire, some for uh, retreats, and um, we had a conference there last year. We're going to host it this coming year, so there's some reduction in uh, training and tuition since we're hosting a three-state conference. Um, the mapping is one that um, increased last year. Uh, this is an item that covers two things. It covers the consultant cost for our online parcel mapping system. Uh, this is access through the home 
page of our website. Um, it's a very useful tool. Uh, we use it a lot, Dean and I use it a lot. We try to um, encourage uh, citizens, realtors, uh, developers to use that site. It has lots of great information on it. It's an online geographic information system uh, type uh, setup. So this item covers the uh, Cartographic Associates, which is our consultant for that site. And then it also covers our parcel mapping consultant work, uh, RJ Turner. So we split those costs with uh, the Lister's office and with um, Dan Sweet, uh, our assessor. And uh, we split it 50-50 because uh, both uh, departments, if you will, benefit. Uh, the other costs are covered under the general government uh, lines uh, that are uh, for the uh, assessment, support the assessment work. The uh, dues to the Regional Planning Commission uh, are going up gradually to support their services. We, we do get a lot of bang for the buck, if you will. Uh, they did the um, Roadside ash inventory, it was about a $2,000 value that they provided free of charge to assist us with that inventory. They support us on transportation projects. Um, Alec and uh, Bill Woodruff and I work uh, pretty closely on uh, getting support on various transportation projects. Uh, basically working with us around everything from um, doing scoping studies like the Stowe Street Bridge over at Thatcher Brook, we're working on that right now. So they provide us a, a good level of support services that I feel is well worth the uh, investment of that, uh, what will be a little over 6,400. Central Fund Economic Development Corp uh, provides economic development services throughout the region. And uh, so we support that organization. They have a new executive director uh, who's, uh, I think, very good, does a lot with workforce training and also with job fairs that have been very popular. Uh, Karen mentioned, mentioned that. Alyssa's worked with them on a job fair in Waterbury that was supported through that organization. So that's um, as a result of our uh, support investment there. Uh, travel's pretty straightforward. Um, have some, it fluctuates year to year depending on um, how far I have to travel. Went to Maine year before last, so that added some, but um, again, it supports the, the work that we do, uh, paying mileage primarily for uh, vehicle travel for both uh, Dean and me. Then, um, Office equipment, uh, we have two new computers. Uh, Dean and I both finally got new computers that replaced the ones we got right after Tropical Storm Irene that were getting very glitchy. And uh, we just got those. And uh, we have requested uh, for the whole office to get a, a replacement laptop. Our laptop that we use for taking minutes and meetings and projecting um, Pro, uh, information. Information, you got it, thank you. Uh, will not project because it's not compatible with our system in this room anymore. So um, we're looking to replace that uh, laptop and Bill's agreed that we'll try to do that through the general. Yeah, it'll be budget. in a different budget. Different budget than this one. But, uh, but that's, so that means seeing. more people besides the planning yeah. department can use it. We'll so share it around. Yeah. Carla can take it to meetings, absolutely, right. instead of maybe her own. <laughs> Okay, she nods. Okay, good. So, um, Conservation Commission has requested $1,000 to support um, their various projects. They've been very active, as you know, with the Schutzville Wildlife Quarter. They're also uh, very supportive of the work of the Planning Commission on the uh, bylaw uh, rewrite uh, with the Unified Development Bylaws. And then um, Karen mentioned the Revitalize and Waterbury support of uh, 17000 uh, 12,000 supporting their payroll and office expenses, and then 5,000 goes, but that goes towards uh, marketing, as I understand it. Under the revenue, uh, we talked about the, uh, the greeter program with the reservoir, uh, and again, the 2,500 is a placeholder. Uh, the grant that they get will be a pass-through 
Uh, with special projects with the trees, um, this is one that um, I've got another project that um, I'd like to go over with you once we've talked, uh, finished talking about the budget, which is for a tree planting project for next year. So we had a $2,000 grant in 2019 uh, for the Emerald Ash Borer Preparedness Plan, Management Plan. Uh, that grant is being split between last year and this year because uh, we hired Red Star a little late in the year. They'll be finishing that. Uh, we're also requesting another uh, $2,000 grant from the state to do a tree planting project. So uh, that's, uh, the match is 50-50. We'd like to match, match that with cash. So um, if you go back up to the uh, trees project, you'll see that there's an increase um, under that line that I, I think I may have skipped over. So uh, the 7380 is going to cover the rest of the Emerald Ash Borer uh, consultant project. That's about a third, that is a $3,900 contract. Um, we originally hoped to do it more reasonably. With Tom Sweet, we weren't able to do that because Dan's our assessor, basically, and this is federal money. So we ended up hiring Red Start at a somewhat higher rate um, for 3,900. So we have the remainder of their, most of their contract. And then um, we'd also like to get your uh, support and authorization to apply for a, a grant for tree planting, which would be a $2,000 grant request that would be uh, matched with $2,000 in cash. So that's where uh, that uh, 7380 up above, that's why that's such a dramatic increase is because we've got those two projects that will continue through 2020. So we'd, we'd plant $4,000 worth of trees and pay Red Start 3380 for the balance of that contract. So that's the 7380 and there would be $3,000 of grant money to support that 7380. So, um, so Bill, do you have anything you wanted to add at this point before no, we go I, back I, to the tree I, planting? I don't. Um, I think, you know, if there's no questions, uh, I budgeted last year for Dina to be 30 hours a week for the first quarter of the year, but it was busy enough and she was already kind of behind schedule, so that got increased really earlier than I anticipated it would. That's why the difference between the 4815 that was budgeted and the 45405 there's a little bit of overtime in there, but it's, it's really because the 40 hours uh, had started earlier than, than uh, I had. I, th I didn't adjust the budget last year, but it turns out, in the grand scheme of things, that we spent uh, about $6,000 less in this planning budget anyway. So um, that's the only thing I wanted to point out. Okay. Do so you get on um, the trees through the conservation district? Um, these, the trees that we're anticipating would be larger trees. Okay. Um, we do some bare root planting. Uh, we've been planting some uh, fir oaks, for instance, and we get those through the, um, Inter the foundation. Intervale Conservation Inter Nursery. Right. And we've been pretty successful with that program. We get uh, volunteer watering, we all chip in. But um, this project, um, this Caring for Canopy grant program, it's a minimum two inch caliper for shade trees. So we, we usually contract with Evergreen Gardens because they're local. They do a good job. Uh, we like to support the local businesses. And they guarantee a tree for a period of time, too, right? The, they're guaranteed, correct, yeah. So, um, unless there are questions here, why don't we move on to the, um, the tree planting project? And uh, Jane has um, been helping me to develop this. There's, uh, let me just grab one. Actually, just hang on to one. Um, so I'm pa passing out a couple uh, planting plans. As I say, um, Jane and I are both on the tree committee. And um, Jane, why don't I introduce this and then if you'd like to add, add to it. 
Um, so there are two different areas that we, we'd like to focus on. Um, we're going to be somewhat limited. I've asked Evergreen Gardens to prepare a cost estimate. This grant is actually due this Friday, so it's moving fairly quickly. Um, they've just gotten back from their uh, post-holiday vacation, so um, I expect the office and he's going to work up a cost estimate. But I think the first area we'd like to focus on is, the, is Winooski Street uh, near the Winooski River. And um, we have an area that um, is the back of that grove field. And um, we'd like to plant some oaks that will tolerate flooding, swamp white oaks, and um, a few flowering crab. And then on the other side, on the community garden side, we lease that parcel, as, as you may know, from Green Mountain Power. So um, we'd like to plant uh, three of, it's a hybrid elm called Accolade that's uh, very resistant to Dutch elm. It's not a true American elm, it's a, it's a hybrid. And then um, up along the Hope Cemetery, we'd like to plant a few flowering crab apple. And uh, Bill let me know that the cemetery commissioners have decided to remove the big cedar hedge that's under the power lines along Winooski Street. So ultimately, we'll work with the cemetery commissioners. We're definitely going to touch base with them on, on the flowering crab. But ultimately, we'll work with them on a, a planting that will replace that uh, cedar hedge, which has just gotten really scruffy. It's got a lot of cloth that's growing in it. So that's going to be easier to remove it from scratch. Definitely. The other site is over at Pilgrim Industrial Park, and um, I've been in communication with uh, Wayne Lamberton with uh, Superior Development. And uh, this is the piece that's uh, in front of the Pilgrim 5 building. It's uh, across from where the old uh, Gray House used to be, the old station lumber. And um, Wayne's very much in support of doing a straight tree planting. When we uh, did the planting along um, the section of Railroad Street, which is a little further up towards Stowe Street, and then uh, going up the hill, and the, the piece that's, um, that's a bit what I call the upper section of Railroad Street, we, we waited on this because we didn't know what the plans were for uh, future building. And um, so I've talked to Wayne, he's fine uh, doing a street tree planting, getting some trees started, and basically completing the, the plantings for uh, the railroad street. And uh, so this may very well become a two year project. Uh, that's what I'm anticipating. Um, Wayne's willing to give us permission. We have a very narrow right of way for railroad street, so we're going to have to obtain um, an agreement or right of way. For, for that area, we should have it anyway because of the sidewalk and the, the um, street lights. So um, we'll work with Evergreen Gardens. Um, but what we'd like to do, so I did, first, uh, Jane, I should ask you, did, is there anything you want to add before we talk about the money? Um, no, I think that on Railroad Street, it's something that's been talked about for a long time. And as Steve noted, you can see in the photograph, there are some maples that were planted just to the upper left above where those oaks are shown. And they've probably been in there for 10 years. Um, so it's kind of a continuation, because it's sort of a gap. This, this, and it's an important part of our town. The street's really been greatly improved over the years, certainly since I've lived here 30 years. So um, there's trees planted at Pilgrim Park Road, so I think it would be really a nice asset to that area. Um, and I think, I, and we did a site walk the tree committee looked at Winooski Street last June and we saw that there was an opportunity for some tree planting here. So, trying to be resilient in case there's flooding, planting things that are can tolerate the wet. So, that's it. Great. Those northern white oaks, are they, are they, uh, I mean, can they grow into like huge trees? The, the northern red oak do get large. Um, that says northern white oak. Oh, it says oh the, the swamp white oak. I'm sorry. No, I think he said, no, no, said northern no, white oak. It says it's northern white oak, oak on, on the, on the on railroad park. street. Right. Yeah. So, so, right. So railroad street would be northern white oak, our native oak here. The um, Winooski street would be swamp uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's that should be northern red oak. I, I was going to say, we don't have okay, any sorry. red oak around here. That's my mistake. <laughs> I just mislabeled it. Sorry. Okay, so, so this is just a standard red oak. Red oak. Sorry. This is a standard red oak den. Northern so, red oak. So right. they can grow substantially large. I guess my question was, I was wondering if these were a genetically altered type tree that only grows to a certain height and just fills out more than and then your standard tree uh, and my real question was uh, uh, obviously is it Lamberton's responsibility to to uh, maintain that lawn area and uh, you know I know at my house I've got two big maples out in front of the house that completely contaminate my front yard with leaves to the point where it's a huge effort to uh, Remove them, and I didn't know, you know, just how big these trees would get eventually. And yeah, well, sure, they'll they'll get large, uh, you know, just like the um, standard bigger than standard the maples. Red oak. Yeah, right. Okay. And to answer your maintenance question, um, yes, the, um, they pay to uh, Brian's yeah. to maintain that area, do the mowing, do the leaf pickup. Um, they planted some of the street trees. They planted the red oak across the street for the parking lot. So there was no concern from them for the No, that's Wayne better. was very much in support of it. I think he sees it as part of the beautification sure. for the industrial yeah. park. Yeah. And um, no, I think he, he thought that it would be fine. Yeah. Good. So what we'd be looking for this evening is um, an authorization to apply for a $2,000 uh, caring canopy grant from the state of Vermont um, matched with a $2,000 uh, local cash match for a total project of $4,000. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. I was going to say, I think, I don't know, if Jane would, it might have to recuse herself from that one, wouldn't she? <laughs> All right. Uh, motion been made and seconded to um, authorize the extra spending for some tree beautification efforts here in the village. Uh, if there's any more discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thumbs up, Steve. Can you Carla, on the motion? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let me ask Mark. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it, Steve, thanks. <laughs> Before you go on, Mike, you have to slide into the mic and also don't put papers on top of the table, Mike. There's nothing wrong with this one because it won't stay on. I don't think it's trying to talk directly. It's, it's not turning red, so I don't know if she it's... She was saying that your papers are on the other microphone. Oh, um, there you go. Okay, Bill, I guess we're ready for the next item. <coughs> State Caring for Canopy Grant Application for just, Street. We just did Street. That. I thought so. <laughs> okay, then it's the next one. Any other budget discussion? Yeah, so leave one of these for Matt and then just pass the rest of them down. This won't take long at all. So um, while we wait for that, uh, next week on Monday, we will review with uh, Celia and perhaps Bill Woodruff the highway budget and the CIP budgets related to um, highway. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the parks budget and probably the recreation CIP. And um, my hope is that in addition to those specific budgets that we'll be talking about, and clearly you'll be able to make changes to those if you, if you need to, but I'm also hoping to give you um, a budget next week that says if you approve the budgets that I just talked about along with everything else that we've talked about last week and this week, that this is where we'll be. And then on the last Monday of the month, 
uh, if we need to come back and just show you the final after you, you know, make whatever changes you need to do last week. So from my perspective, Monday night next week is going to be the heavy lifting uh, meeting uh, that we've got to kind of get through a couple of budgets that we haven't been through at all and then try to present everything as if you approve those budgets that I present to you next week for the first time. And then on the final Monday, uh, I'll be able to come back and say, okay, these are the changes that you requested on the 20th, and here we are. Um, I met with the library commissioners tonight. Uh, they have approved their budget for all intents and purposes. They will come next Monday as well to briefly present their budget and answer questions. I'm happy to say that the library budget is going to ask for the same exact tax um, levy this year as they did last year, so there's no increase in taxes, which I view as a, a win because we're another year uh, uh, further down the line. So that's a, that's a good thing. So with what you have in front of you tonight, what I just passed out, um, we went through the revenues last week. They're a little bit adjusted. Uh, they're a little higher than they were a week ago. Uh, so are the expenses. But there's, uh, there's three or four small budgets that are in blue font, starting on page two. Uh, we talked about the general fund budget last week. And by and large, you approve that. I'll fine tune that one. But on page two is the public safety budget. Um, the budget that I'm proposing for 2020 is the same exact budget as last year. The state police contract uh, runs through June of 2021. So we've got a year and a half left on that. There's no increase in that contract. Uh, and then um, the uh, WASI budget is the same as it was last year, and special events, which pays for, you know, uh, sheriff's department and the like for some of the parades that we have, same $2,200 budget. Um, the unclassified, I've, I've highlighted that in yellow. Um, I don't know if any of you follow Front Porch Forum, but there's been a little bit of uh, uptick in the discussion about are we ever going to uh, enforce parking regulations in this community. Uh, we've talked about that in the past. I don't have a proposal, but if we're going to do that, it would, it would go in that. I create a new line item, but I just highlighted that budget to say that's where parking enforcement would go if we ever chose to do it. Um, I'll, I'll just go through all of these uh, blue font budgets, and then if you have questions and you want to come back to them, we can. If you flip over to page three, uh, the resource management budget, John Malta was here last week. We talked about that, 35450 for the uh, uh, dues to the Mad River Resource Management Alliance, and then the green up budget. So there's there's a change there. It's about 11 and a three quarter percent increase. That's all based on what uh, Malter told us last week. And Chris already indicated tonight that he's doing his part by cutting his hours. So, um, uh, you know, that would be higher otherwise. Um, the health and social services, again, it's, it's slightly less than last year, 16,405. So it's $15 less than last year. Again, the highlights, uh, we do not have an animal control officer right now. Um, we had... Um, I see, I thought we had one. What happened? What's his name? We had Zeb Town. And when Zeb left, we hired a woman up right. on uh, and Camel's and Hump Road. And, right. and, yeah. and, and evidently, uh, she got in touch with Carla a couple of months ago now, yeah. I think, and she said, Zeb misled me on the number of times I'd be called, and she said, I don't want to do this anymore. So we don't have an animal control officer at the moment. Dang it. Um, <laughs> and I don't think you're going to get one for $500 a year. Nobody wants uh, that job. And uh, if we really yeah, want an true. animal control officer, we probably have to pay somebody $250, $300 a month just to be willing to take the calls. Um, 
the former animal control officer talked to me about a month ago. Um, what's his name from uh, Peter, Peter called me and you know he said, well, you know I tried to do my part, but it was a losing proposition for me in terms of money. It'd have to be a lot more money if I was going to be able to do it. So I think if you want to get somebody, uh, we talked about the age of volunteerism, but volunteering to do jobs like animal control officer is just, nobody wants to do that. So uh, we don't have one right now. Our phone isn't ringing off the hook. Um, do you get any calls? Once a month, maybe. We did have a pretty serious dog bite a couple of weeks ago when a gentleman who delivers, um, was delivering Meals on Wheels lunches and went to a particular house and got pretty badly bitten by a dog and uh, the owner couldn't produce any rabies evidence of rabies shots so the individual ended up with like getting 20, 20 different shots to make sure he didn't get rabies so uh, that dog was... mad because he didn't bring him food too? <laughs> Did yeah. the town pay for the so. shots? Who, or no. Did his insurance pay for the I, shots? I, I don't know. I'm just wondering <coughs> what happened. Was there any reprimand for the dog being out of control? From whom? I don't know. There's no, no officer. <laughs> There's no animal control officer. Hmm. Pretty bad, though. So anyway, uh, that's an issue. We might, you know, it's, it's not going to be a budget breaker, but you might want to think about you know, typically we we seek these volunteers for these positions around the first of April. I think it is. Um, if we decided that if we could get somebody and it was going to cost us five or six thousand dollars, we could handle it without. You know, we don't have to put it in the budget, is what I'm saying. But I'm just letting you know we don't have an animal control officer right now, and I don't think you're going to get one for the old-fashioned price of five hundred dollars. Back to that comment, though, you're saying we get about a call a month, but that was two. That was a higher call volume than what she was expecting, or did she just have a bad run? No, I get a call now about once a month. Yeah. I think she was getting a higher. Because her number's out, out there, there as the yeah. Yeah. Right. So what do you do now if you get a call? I tell them I don't have an ACO. There's nothing really nothing <clears> to <throat> do. What if we offered a double Zeb's pay? <laughs> he never even put in for any pay. I know. You know, I'm, I can go back and look. We, we paid, I, th I think we were up in the $3,000 range maybe yeah, when we so had Peter. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's been $500 forever. When Peter Trammell was the animal control officer, I think we were paying probably, um, you know, $2,500, $3,000. I can look and bring that next week, so I'll, I'll do that. And he's, uh, I'm just going to say, he swung the pendulum the other way there for, oh yeah, uh, you know, and it, and it hasn't. He did a, he did a good job if it, if it was, there's just, you know, there's a little bit of bedside manner issue when it comes there. <laughs> but other than that, yeah. Both with the public and with some members of the staff. Anyway, on page five. Uh, the debt management expenses, uh, this, this uh, principal and interest there is to pay the municipal government share of the debt service on this building. So it's declining slightly every year. So 106,880 is our share. The library share is a little bit higher than that. Um, I want to say it's probably about 200. $40,000 altogether, something like that. Um, and really that's it for what I want to show you tonight. Um, as I said, uh, next week uh, I will have everything as if you were going to uh, approve the budget uh, as I will show it to you next week. And I'm hoping that it's in a state that isn't far off from what you're willing to try to support. So far, I've been pleasantly surprised. I haven't even yet tried to you know, press the button and say what it is. But just in terms of my uh, plugging in the numbers, in terms of the expenses, 
and looking at where we are standing with fund balances and the like, um, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic right now. Uh, one last thing that I'll leave you with, um, we, you know, we decided in November to <coughs> buy a roadside mower, and we decided to buy two fire trucks. The second fire truck won't be paid for until well into this year, probably June or so. Uh, we have not borrowed any money uh, as of yet because we have enough money in the bank to continue to pay our bills. Um, but I've been thinking a little bit, and uh, certainly for the roadside mower, uh, if we have to borrow for that, that was a $116,000 purchase. Um, you know, we've got authority to borrow that over a five-year span. Um, we'll have the machine longer than five years, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, what I'm thinking is that if we borrowed the $116,000 uh, at the end of this year uh, and then borrow for four years, so instead of dividing 116 by 5, you'd divide it by 4, so the principal payment on that would be $29,000 a year. So in effect, we could pay our $29,000 of the first year in cash this year and then borrow you know, pay for the 116 over four years as opposed to five. Um, and I think that we're in a position that we can probably borrow from ourselves uh, for a lot of this. And that's a good thing in that, you know, we'll pay interest, but rather than paying the bank, we can pay for us, pay uh, ourselves back. So I've looked at a couple of different things. Um, the tax stabilization fund, uh, at the end of the year, as of December um, 31st, the tax stabilization fund has crested a million dollars now. Um, and we've got about 440,000 of that is invested. And of the, uh, the remainder, uh, we've got $667,000 lent to ourselves. And we're paying for the power truck and for the rescue truck and for the greater. Um, the high water mark that we owed ourselves from the tax stabilization fund was 2017. So that was, uh, we borrowed from the tax stabilization fund for infrastructure, for uh, fire and highway vehicles. We were at $853,300 uh, owed to ourselves. We've paid that down now by $186,000. So we owe ourselves $667,000. So clearly, right there, we've got enough capacity to borrow this $116,000 without really going significantly higher. And we're borrowing it from ourselves. In 2017, when we had $853,000 borrowed to ourselves, the value of the fund was uh, $972,000. So we're about $28,000 more value, and we have $186,000 less lent to ourselves. So that's a good situation. Um, in our uh, Veterans Memorial Fund, uh, we that is valued at $94,000, and we don't have enough to, buy, to lend to buy the whole uh, $116,000 worth of, of uh, the, the, the machine. But, you know, we've got, we've, we've got some capacity there. And then uh, what I hadn't factored in before, and I talked to the cemetery commissioners uh, just the other day, uh, you know, we're in a fortunate position that our cemetery fund uh, has got a fund balance of $563,000, and they've got about 470000 of that is invested. And the same thing, I've, I mentioned last week, Mark, when you weren't here, uh, on Tuesday last week, I went to Edward Jones' office, and I sold uh, securities from most all of these funds just because the stock market's at an all-time high now. Uh, 
took a little bit of money off the table and we'll be able to, uh, rather than just keep that in cash doing nothing, we can pay for some of these things. So uh, I don't have all the details worked out, but uh, I think the more that we can use our own money to finance the things that we can't necessarily pay for, um, uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, one particular person in the community, when I mentioned this to him, this was a, a year or so ago, said, well, why don't you just leave the money in the, you know, borrow the money from the bank and, you know, pay them 3% or whatever it is and leave the money invested. You might make 7 or 8% if you do that and, you know, you're, you're going to be to the good 5%. I said, well, when you look at how our portfolio is structured, we really have more than our investment policy allows you know, in securities right now, we should put it in fixed income, and it's hard to get fixed income bonds, uh, you know, fixed income uh, uh, securities that pay the 4% that we're paying to ourselves. So it's a way to diversify the portfolio. So I'm going to be working on that as well. Um, and, you know, if we don't have to send that 4% on a million dollars or half a million dollars, to the bank and we can send it to ourselves, uh, we'll be in a better situation. So the principal payment would, would be around 29000 Yeah, and you could, do it, you could do it one of two ways, Chris. You could borrow the full one sixteen, and pay it off over four years, or you could just say, take $29,000, so take one sixteen, and uh, subtract 29000 from it. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be, um, you know, that, well, it would be 95000 or something like that. And then you could pay that $95,000 back over a period of time. But uh, No, I guess my goal for, to, when I asked that question was just to point out that of that 29000 what portion of that just is money that we would have given to... Airfields every year for the rental of that tractor. If we have oh, yeah. bought one, so really out of pocket, additional out yeah. of pocket. I think it was is like ninety five hundred dollars or something yeah. like that, wasn't it? So, so yeah. I mean, it's that, about a third. So, you know, there's two good sides to that. So anyway, um, I'm working to try to um, meet your goal of no tax increase. I'm not even close to promising that yet, but. If we can borrow what we need, and you know, we might not have, you know, we've got authority for those three pieces of equipment to borrow $1.6 million. And I don't think we're going to have to borrow that even from ourselves in this first year, probably a half a million or so. Um, but uh, more to come next week. But we're in a decent position right yeah, now. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate this last go through here uh, yeah it gives me hope too that we're that we're gonna have to somehow come out of this well, I think that's a good with still I, some skin on our back here right I and, and again I haven't spent a lot of time yet with the highway budget clearly that's our single highest department um, Celia and Woody and I are meeting on Wednesday I've already you know, given Celia's proposal to me a once-over back in early December when she first got it to me. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's not going to be a huge increase. It, it's probably going to be up some. But uh, anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. But. I just think your strategy to borrow, at least for the mower against ourselves, is a very sound policy to support what you're doing. Thanks. Okay, that's all I got for tonight, unless you have questions. Nope, I'm just I'll make who's gonna, the motion to adjourn. He's got a motion to adjourn, yep. I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> all those in favor, say aye. 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 I won't be here.